On your mark. Not yet. All right, you're all set, Mayor. Thank you and welcome. Good evening, everybody, to our staff report, our, our, our uh, study session for uh, micro mobility. Uh, we are having Sigal Michael lead us in this uh, conversation. So I'll hand it off to you. Thank uh, you, Mayor. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, before uh, you hand it off to staff, oh, I'm I recommend sorry. that you take a roll call and make a comment. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I got a little ahead of myself there. Thank you. So with that, I'll pass it back to the city uh, clerk to do a roll call, please. Council Member O'Brien. Present. Uh, Council Member Beach. Present. Council Member Colson. Here. Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Here. Mayor Ortiz. Here. And before we open it up, we're going to open it up to public comment. So uh, Madam City Clerk, do we have any um, members of the public wishing to speak? So this is for non-agenda items, and I don't see anyone with their hand up, and I don't have any emails, so you guys are good to go. Very good. Now let's move on to item number four, which is a discussion of micro-mobility sharing programs. And now, Ms. Michael, please take it off. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Everyone sees the presentation. Okay, are we good to go? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me here this evening to talk about e-mobility, also known as bike or scooter sharing. I'm going to be referring it to as e-mobility because it's gonna be electric bikes and electric scooters. But <clears throat> I put this image on the front page to sort of show like the jumble <laughs> of different messaging that this has and that it could be confusing and that there is a lot of activity around it, but I'm gonna do my best to focus on it here and help um, the council um, provide direction to the city, to staff. Okay, so why now, why here? Um, just a couple months ago at the goal setting um, session meeting in January, um, most of the council said yes or maybe to talking about e-mobility. We also have past experience. I wanna say it was a positive experience, but it did have its challenges with Lime Bike. Um, it was really neat to see how popular it got or with people using it around the city. But of course we all you know, probably still have scarred images of those line bikes sitting in the middle of the sidewalk or on people's yards. So lessons learned from that experience. We've also got an interest from an, um, community members and an e-mobility operator, specifically BIRD, which a representative from BIRD, Carolyn, is on the uh, meeting, I think. So if, as we move on, if you have questions specifically about um, at least one vendor, they're online to an help answer. And then ultimately providing um, e-mobility does offer an alternative transportation mode to reduce VMT and greenhouse gas emissions in the city. It gets people active. It's a way for people to maybe run errands between our different downtown areas during lunch or a last mile from when they take transit to their office or potentially to um, where they live or to a local park. So it, it will provide some sort of reduction in uh, the city as people choose to use this alternative transportation. So e-mobility has been going on in the Bay Area, even though Lime Bike left Burlingame a couple years ago, they did the same to all the city, the small cities, and they pivoted to scooters. And the three big cities, San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose, have had Bay Wheels, that's a bike sharing program that's MTC sponsored, and they've had different scooter companies coming in and out right now. Lime, Spin, and Link are the ones that are seen around, and those are being <coughs> used and um, granted through a permit in each of those cities. In Fremont and Richmond and Marin, there's newish programs coming around, probably the oldest ones in Fremont, that those are also were funded from an MTC grant. And, um, and these are large grants, and also they, these areas tend to have also um, income qualifying 
uh, reasons that they got the grant. But these programs, um, Hopper is a bicycle and e-bikes is an e-bike. Hopper is e-bikes, pedal bike, and scooters in Fremont. And then the last four are pr permit programs happening. Now, this list is not doesn't include all of them. There's other cities that may be working on it. These are just the ones I know of that are the farthest ahead. But a lot of cities are, I think, in similar position as us that they may be interested, but not, you know, haven't taken the step yet, or maybe further, a little bit further along than us. And then I wanted to go into a little bit about the, even within a permit process, there's different approaches that a city can choose to do. This table is also in the staff report. I know it may be a little hard to read here, but I highlighted the a few items just to draw out for each city. For example, in Emeryville, they're requiring that their scooters that um, ride in their city have a locking mechanism attached to the scooter. So their argument for that is that means a scooter can't just be left floating in a sidewalk. It has to be attached to a bike rack or something else. So it, which would ideally mean it's on a street furniture and off the sidewalk. Red, and, and Emeryville also, they have quite a few programs now. And the reason they're the most successful is also because they're right in the corridor between San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley. So they get the benefit of um, all those riders who are going through those areas. Redwood City just passed their permit um, a couple months ago, and they're working with Bird, maybe another company, I'm not sure, on going through the permit process. And they were one of the few that I noticed had um, fees, but also a fee per rider. So it's some, you know, in a way they're revenue sharing with the company with a potential permit um, applic application. San Mateo did theirs a couple of years ago and they ha don't have, no one's applied for their permit. And they, at that time, probably because they were still feeding off the scooter mess that was happening in many cities, they decided on no scooters. And that may change in the future. And Berkeley is happening as of now, they just closed their application and are reviewing. They'll, they'll allow, and this is just for scooters, they'll allow up to three operators and they have a competitive application. So I don't know how many they've received, but they'll decide if they'll allow up to three or even one based on their own internal um, rate system. I do want to highlight that, amazingly enough, we do have some sort of bike sharing program in Burlingame. This is in our Bayshore Hotel area. This is a picture I went to visit in Embassy Suites. The Embassy Suites, Marriott, Doubletree, and Hyatt are using unlimited biking, which, um, <clears throat> as you can see, the bikes are stacked out here. Um, you could see on the screen um, the QR code that someone would just need to scan on their app. And to unlock the bike, it's $15 an hour, and they would could take it anywhere they want. Um, when I talked to the people at the front desk, they said whoever wants a helmet, they have some in stock that they could take, but not, not many people use them. And even though all the bikes are lined up here, they say, you know, in the middle of the day, they're very popular, especially by flight crews that stay at the hotels and want a bit of exercise or fresh air. And the company does some revenue sharing with the hotel. So the hotel's giving them the space. I forget the percentage, but they, they get a certain percentage of revenue from um, the, um, each bike ride. When I contacted them to potentially expand into Burlingame, their model is based on working in these sort of hotel corridors or on campuses and less on cities. They would be open to working with the city, but that it would be at quite a high cost for a city. They would want to the city to invest in these dock stations up to $20,000 per station. And the way they create that argument is, you know, you find a corporate sponsor to basically put that station um, in there at their workplace. So I don't know if it's a good fit for Burlingame, but oh, and I do want to mention it's $15 an hour, which may seem, it sounded like a lot to me at first, but it actually isn't if you consider that um, a lot of these 
bike and scooter shares are about 30, 35 cents a minute, and it, it adds up pretty quickly. So the $15 an hour is just, you know, how, how you um, market it. And then this picture I took from, I found in Redwood City's presentation, so I thought it would be helpful just to show um, um, on the bottom picture here is bike sharing in San Jose. And the rest, these top two are not in California, but it, it shows you what a scooter docking station can look like. And then here in the corner where it says Washington DC, this is interesting to us because it shows a bike corral where you don't have a docking station, but it's a controlled way to park scooters. I, I meant a scooter corral. And that's basically the big difference between these app, these programs today than when we saw them a couple of years ago, the parking and riding controls that they're offering. Along with making um, these companies apply through a permit or some controlled way, um, once the company's in, these operators the work with city staff to really provide um, either distinct parking locations. You see this company here, Link in San Diego, all these P's and also Hopper in Fremont show where those scooters should be parked. And a company can either offer an incentive by saying, if you park on these P's, you'll get, let's say 50 cents off your next ride, or they could control, I think they could control the vehicle to only be able to be parked there. So let's say someone leaves it somewhere else, their account is going to continue running on it. The other thing I wanted to point out here is if you see um, this yellow area, that's a low speed zone. So if you ride a scooter and you go into this area, the scooter would slow down. And then here in Lincoln Emeryville, the purple area is, I, I, I highlighted it said no parking, city regulations prohibit parking in this zone. So there are some controls where you work with this um, company to say exactly where you want it or not. And I think the red areas are also um, no ride zones. So it's like no parking and then no ride zones. And here's another picture of what those corrals could look like if you were to designate. And it, it's not necessarily means it's painted on the sidewalk. This happens through geofencing, which um, the, the the software system of the pro operator speaks to the vehicle, the scooter, and it knows, you know, its boundaries of where it could go and where it can't and where it can park. I apologize, I can't explain that in a more <laughs> technical way. <laughs> and then, you know, I did a, just a little like pros and cons of e-bikes versus scooters. I think, you know, all these could be argued either way, but just as something to think about, e-bikes do go faster and at up to 20 miles per hour and scooters are slower, um, if that's, you know, something to think about. I think even though, you know, our experience with line bikes is that they did block the sidewalk, I think bicycles are probably less likely to block areas because they um, instinctively, maybe intuitively more are parked at bike racks whereas scooters may be more easily littered on the sidewalk. Um, I, I wrote bikes go further distances and scooters shorter. That's probably not always the case, but bike, the e-bikes can probably have an easier time going in the hilly areas of Burlingame than the scooters, I would, I would assume. And then the bikes are usually ridden on bike lanes or the street, whereas I'm, you know, scooters have the challenge of probably being ridden on the sidewalk. And, but they belong in bike lanes around the street. And then, you know, there's the challenges that ongoing challenges of minors riding them, um, wearing helmets and just vandalism that may occur to these um, vehicles. And not all those, you know, none of these have been solved completely, but they've all been improved, I think, since we last saw line bike, mostly because of both um, vend operator and user experience. It's just knowing better, better habits on how to do bike sharing and scooter sharing. So I'm here today, you know, basically to start a discussion about this. And, you know, my four key questions are, do we want to pursue e-mobility? I think it could be, you know, a very neat um, opportunity for Burlingame. 
Do we want to have a vehicle preference? We don't necessarily need to have one depending on how we do the permit, but maybe we have one. And then if there is an implementation preference, you know, along with potentially applying for future grants or doing a permit, there's also the approach we did with Line Bike, which is to do uh, a, an RFP and a pilot program. That That's probably, well, me, I don't know. I'm trying to see which one's the most staff intensive, but that would require a bit of work. And then if we wanted to do all this, you know, what are some of the concerns and controls to consider, let's say, it could be as small as we don't want scooters to ride in the farmer's market on Sunday. It could be control to that detail versus um, we want stronger controls so that minors don't, people under 18 don't ride the scooters or bikes. So this is where I open that um, discussion to everyone else and I um, would be glad and excited to hear comments and try and answer questions. Great. Let's start. Let's start with questions. Colleagues, I see uh, Council Member O'Brien has a question. Uh, thank you to the mayor. Um, I actually have a big concern with the e-scooters. Um, I mean, when you Google e-scooters, you see a lot of uh, issues with um, injuries. And um, there was a UCSF study um, that actually studied this from 2014 to 2018 and saw an increase of 222% injuries. Um, and a third of those were head injuries. So um, my question then becomes, who is liable in the long run? Would the city be liable? No, um, I don't think so because I mean, maybe Michael could help answer this, but through the permit, if we were to do, let's say a permit, you know, um, there's, liability is on the operator. And then when a user signs on to use one of those vehicles, we probably sign off on our liability. Would you agree, Michael, or? Yeah, I mean, we would we would be, if we were to pursue um, some sort of um, contractual agreement or permitting agreement with the e-scooter with e provider, um, you know, we would want to negotiate indemnity provisions, insurance provisions. Um, however, um, you know, if somebody were to be riding uh, an e-scooter on our streets and get injured, um, you know, they may very well sue, you know, try to name the city um, and, you know, claim that the roadway was, you know, somehow uh, contributed to it. Um, so there is exposure there. Um, we would try to mitigate that as much as we could. Um, and, um, you know, but, but that is, that is a, a factor to be concerned about. And so that exposure you just described would be the same whether the person is riding on a rented scooter or their own scooter. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and it, and it could be the same sort of, um, and, and you're right. So, um, Mr. Mayor, so if somebody were riding their own private scooter or let's say even their own private bike right now, right, which they could do if they hit a pothole, they could say, hey, you know, your pothole, your, the condition of your streets contributed to my injury. Um, so, yeah. Um, my other question is, could you ban the scooters from being on the sidewalks? Because I worry about our downtown areas. So um, just because of older people, and <clears throat> scooters swinging, you know, in and out around people and so forth, which I have seen in Burlingame Avenue, uh, which to me is quite dangerous. So, um, Mayor, if you like, I can answer that yes, question. Um, so the California Vehicle Code provides that riding an e-scooter on the sidewalk uh, is a violation of state law. So that's already there um, in state law. We would certainly, and, and there is, um, uh, there are ways that you can message that um, by requiring, for example, any e-scooter operator to have clearly uh, that sort of message on the scooter itself, on um, kiosks, on their website, that sort of thing. Um, but the city would not need to adopt its own regulations because that's already a provision in state law. Okay. The question is enforcement on that one. Enforcement right, exactly. is always the, yeah. So enforcement is a different question, but yeah. Right. Okay, and then my last question um, is for the e-bikes, I would assume they require docking stations 
um, how much would those docking stations cost? I mean, we did get a cost from the um, business that's doing it at the hotels, but I'm not sure what the generalized cost would be overall if it was another company. I, I don't know that myself either. And that would be something we would either discover through an RFP or put out a permit and see, you know, what kind of response we got. It is interesting to me, you know, that while scooter, it seems that bikes aren't really using that model of no cost to the city and scooters are still, you know, able to do this model of no cost to the city. But Hopper and Bolt, which is in Fremont and, um, and Marin and Richmond, I could contact them and find out how much their docking stations cost and what kind of, um, what, what that would cost the city to work with you know, programs like that. Okay, thank you, Sagal. I appreciate the presentation. And was your question regarding the, the cost of the docking stations or the cost to use the bikes? The cost of docking stations. Got it. Okay, good. Uh, see, I, in my mind, it was the uh, operator would pay for their own docking stations, but good thought. Okay, well, I brought so, that up because the one that's working the hotels is charging for the docking station. So I didn't know, is that the same with the rest of the businesses or do they do a no cost? I think it's know. the same and that's what the, the MTC grant pays for. Great. Thank you. Uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm trying to understand what in the in the venture world we call the use case. You know, who's going to use this? And and the, and so I have two questions. The one is, what did we learn, um, Segal, from the Lime Bike uh, year long, you know, beta test? Where were people actually going? Um, do we have data like that? Did Lime Bike give that to us? We don't have, you know, data like that, like heat maps and so on, that would be really helpful. I will say that Emeryville and Berkeley, um, I know, and actually all of them, also Redwood City, in their permit um, application, they require for that data to be shared. And then Emeryville also shared that then they even um, contract with another company that takes that data and converts it into heat maps that makes it usable for um, those cities. And they found that to be extremely helpful, especially when they're applying for other grants for bike lanes and so on to show like what's popular. I wish we had that in Burlingame. We don't um, have that information, but I would say as an assumption, you know, of where we saw, I think they were most, I don't know, I'm not sure. I mean, we saw bikes everywhere, right. but centered right. around the downtown area, probably the most popular. Yeah, so um, what I would suggest is that we reach out to Line Bike. It can't hurt to ask. They may, I mean, I can almost assure you they collected a lot of data because they were being financed by venture capitalists and they like to measure how things are going. So they might still have the data. It's kind of old, uh, but it wouldn't hurt to ask. Um, my impression is that um, unlike some other larger cities where people have a, a large downtown and they might go from one end to another, a lot of our users were um, last mile users or first mile users. Um, a bike to get home, or a scooter to get home and, um, and then it would get left on the street, which irritated a lot of people. Um, I like the idea of a bike rack because then they live somewhere, but I worry that in our city, that would actually significantly impact the amount of use they would get. Right. So that's kind of where I'm struggling a little bit to, to see the use case. I realize it's cool and trendy, but is it, will it really get used is kind of my question. Um, and yeah, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Colson. Thank you. Um, so my, um, my thoughts are similar to my previous two colleagues, but I wanna take uh, one clarification. So Seagal, I just wanna let you know that Jan Pepper did get back to us. Um, because as you all know, we did this e-bike um, program through PCE for very low income families where we gave the family, you know, 
families funding to actually purchase an e-bike. And we actually did get data on that, um, Vice Mayor Brownrig, that, that you would, it was reducing VMT like 38% for people who got the bikes. But to your point, they were going from their home to the grocery store, from their home to BART or wherever they were going, you know, to, um, yeah, could have been to BART. So, or Caltrain. So I too have a concern that if we do put them in, we have to be very strategic. It would have to be, you know, maybe someone who's willing to walk down to Broadway to take a bike to the Ave or someone who's willing to pick it up on El Camino and wants to write it down to, um, you know, Caltrain. So we'd have to be at like, obviously at like parks and things like that. But the reason, the only thing, the thing that really kind of interests me in this is if we could let see if people actually like to ride e-bikes and we could get data back that said, you know, yes, I liked riding it. And if I had an e-bike, I would ride it all the time and I would ride it here to there. Then maybe we could, you know, use that as like a beta test case. And then we could go back in and pilot with PCE for this bike program where we actually help people purchase e-bikes to get them out of their cars. And, um, Jan Pepper came back to Seagal and said that um, they would actually definitely, you know, they would actually be willing to help with the program. They might just need some offsets on the costs. So, um, because my point was, well, great, you did a program, you rolled it out to 800 people for Peninsula Clean Energy, but that's not impactful or meaningful. And if you can't scale it and expand it throughout the county, then you probably should just close it down because it's not really a productive kind of program. So um, I, I like the bike and I think we could try them, but we'd need to collect data and then see if we can roll that data into um, thinking about a, a more expansive program that would apply to more people. Thank you. Um, Council member Beach. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, Seagal. And I'm, I'm actually eager to hear what members of the public think. I think we have some folks here in attendance. Um, I, you know, I think um, I'm excited about the opportunity of bringing some micromobility options back to the city, whether that's bikes, scooters, or some combination of both, given that the transportation sector is our biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. It also contributes to congestion on our street with more cars. A micromobility program could help provide more parking spaces opening up for people who might use micromobility as opposed to competing for parking spaces downtown um, in and our, you know, around our train station. So I think, think there's a really cool opportunity. I did want to share some couple other details and folks in talking with folks from micromobility companies. Um, I thought some of these facts were really interesting. They can really, Seagal mentioned, they can really geofence and prohibit uh, whether it's scooters or bikes, um, but I, I was talking to a scooter company within 50 or 100 feet. So I think to address some concerns, we could geofence and eliminate the ability to ride a scooter anywhere on Burlingame Avenue or anywhere on Broadway. It would just literally shut down so that the electric, you know, it doesn't work. And um, that's pretty cool because they can be up to 50 to 100 feet with um, precision. There's ways to uh, verify with driver's licenses now to make sure that folk riders are 18 and older. So it's a little bit more um, rigorous. Uh, they also, some of these companies do indemnify cities. Um, and then what's kind of interesting is the way they can geofence and provide incentives as Seagal mentioned to uh, park in the proper place. So I think that opportunity to do those corrals, whether it's bike corrals or scooter corrals, it seems to me, I totally agree with Vice Mayor Brownrake. I think a lot of our usage was folks in and out of the residential neighborhoods, but we do have um, opportunity to create corrals where we could have incentives to park, whether it's in our parks, those are sort of places that most people can walk to, or we could take a parking space in a neighborhood and create a little uh, corral zone, you know, if, if a park isn't nearby so that there's easy places to deposit them. And all it is is sort of paint um, in areas where we can create incentives and financial incentives for people to park them in the right place. So I think there's ways to kind of address some of the, the problems that we've had in the past. Um, I did have a question, Seagal, about, I was a little bit confused, uh, the San Mateo program on your slide, do they, 
I know they invested a lot of money in those docking programs. Do they still have that bike share? It's that was, eliminated. they had, they had um, a, a first iteration of what's today Bay Wheel Bikes. I think back then it was Ford Bikes mm -hmm. and they did spend money on it. And they, I think they, they also got an MTC grant and, um, and it followed the same example that I, I think it wasn't successful enough to right. keep in there and, and it moved to the big cities and um you know and and maybe I see Carolyn's hands up maybe she'll talk about this in bird but from what I'm also understanding mm -hmm. at least through bird as a the one vendor I've talked to you know they're playing around with different models to make this make more sense for them in small cities and they see this demand um, in smaller cities um, to have bike sharing. So they're trying to accommodate it. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I think, I do think we would be, I would like to be optimistic, but I don't think we're going to be contenders from what I see on the, uh, on some of the other um, regional committees I sit on that we'd be super contenders for a big MTC grant for a program, just because we don't have the equity metrics and we don't have the ridership. I think I think the way if we want to embark on something like this, we're going to have to embark on a, pro a permit program and a trial program um, with a partner or a pilot program permit based. It seems that that's the way we'd have to bring it here. So I'm interested in hearing what the public thinks and um, other colleagues continuing this conversation. Um, and I guess we'll have comments after. Can I add, um, I, this was in the staff report, but I didn't mention it, you know, that ideally we would have a regional program and maybe that'll come and happen one day, but that feels very slow moving. I think Caltrans, there's a subcommittee meeting on this and CCAG has um, some um, um, study, feasibility study they're doing. But I think ultimately, you know, if all the cities do something similar like a permit system, you know, and then it's not up to a city to pick a company or do an RFP or, and that maybe it would just happen on its own that it would make sense along a corridor, but I don't know. Right. And if okay. it doesn't yeah. work, we can pull the permits. Right. You know, it's, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I do have, uh, it, on, I do have a couple of questions of my own uh, on the geofencing. There's something that uh, Council Member Beach just said that uh, was intriguing to me, but do you have a sense of does it shut off the uh, electric motor, but you can still roll it, or is it just blocks it from rolling? Do you know that? I think it locks the wheels, but maybe um, Caroline can answer that for at least Bird. Okay, we'll save yeah. it for her then. Uh, yeah. And then on the bikes, I, 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 the uh, vice mayor makes a really good point. If we only have one set of racks, it forces you into a round trip. Uh, versus a one-way trip, which we, uh, I think the line bikes were really, uh, people, they were popular because they provided that one-way trip uh, thing. And so uh, on the racks, what I was picturing was multiple racks in different parts of town so that you could do that. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear more about that. So uh, so any of the models that you looked at, uh, Segal, did they include multiple racks or was yes. it just one Yes, they did. Okay. Because yeah. you see them in the city where they have racks all over the city. And yeah. Okay. So with that, let's open it to public comment and uh, and then we'll go back to colleagues for final comments. Megan, you're with me. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Yes, I am with you. Okay. Um, we'll start with Carolyn. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Great, my name is Caroline and I am with Bird Scooters. I'm on their city partnerships team. So I work with cities primarily along the West Coast, similar to Burlingame to help bring micromobility or e-scooters to their communities. Um, I've really enjoyed the presentation and the conversation so far. Would love to answer any questions that you may have. Um, but first and foremost, I do think it's really important to point out the why BIRD does what we do. And that is really to provide transportation to anyone without limiting where they can go or how they would like to go there. Um, so we do have a dockless model, which does differ from most of the e-bike programs that were previously discussed. Um, but I would love to answer any specific questions as it may pertain to e-scooters and BIRD coming to Burlingame. 
Can you answer the question about how the um, scooters lock through the geofencing? Yep, great question. So the way that the geofencing lock works is really similar to like an invisible fence. So our scooters really cannot get beyond any of those invisible boundaries. So what happens is when you approach that boundary, the scooter starts to beep really loudly to notify the scooter. And then it slows down until it stops. And it stops right when you're on that line. And then you have to um, roll the scooter back. The wheels do lock a little bit. So it does prohibit somebody taking the scooter into a location they're not going to. But you simply roll it back within the operating zone and carry on your way or find a better place to end your ride. All within that operating zone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, anybody have questions for uh, Ms. Dupuy? Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes, go Council Member Beach. Thank you. Do you indemnify cities with BIRD? Yes, we do. There is an indemnification clause in all of our contracts that we execute with the cities. Um, so the cities are completely indemnified if, you know, any liability or anything of that sort. And thanks. And do you have a, um, when people ride, is there a, a, a reminder to them that they are not allowed to ride on the sidewalk on the scooter? Is there a, or is there any, any part of the uh, login process? Absolutely. So reminding and educating our riders to not ride on the sidewalk is very, very important to us as that is typically the biggest concern that cities have. So when people start their ride, when they create their account, um, they're reminded to not ride on the sidewalk. There's also a large sticker on the vehicle reminding people not to ride on the sidewalk and to use a bike lane or the right of way and road. Excellent. Any other questions, colleagues? Okay, thank you, Caroline, for being with us tonight. And uh, will that, do we have any other public comment? Uh, yes, we do. We have uh, Rayanne. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. You can go ahead. Good evening, Burlingame City Council. My name is Ryan Modishemi. Um, I am a co-team lead of Move San Mateo, which is a active transportation um, advocacy group in San Mateo, Burlingame, and Hillsboro. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, convey my strong support for um, e-bike and e-scooter micro mobility options to be expanded in the in Burlingame. As someone who bikes regularly around town, I think that it's incredibly important. And I and I would bike even more or scooter even more at, um, were a, a, a mobility program such as what you're studying um, put in place. I think it's imperative to have the ability uh, to just go out and go and have and I and to that extent I think that both dockless and docked models are important to maintain the openness and flexibility of a program and both e-scooter and e-bikes should be considered. Um, I think a lot is said about safety concerns and issues and I appreciate the council's judicious consideration of ways to reduce it and mitigate the, the, the safety impacts. I would say that um, getting more people out of cars for their transportation needs and onto e-scooters and e-bikes is a net safety benefit for Burlingame and for anywhere where these programs are um, implemented. It's much less dangerous or, um, um, or um, fatal to be involved in a scooter collision as opposed to a um, as opposed to a, a vehicle, a car collision. And um, I think that the data and studies repeatedly show that um, folks are using these um, for the, these, these um, methods of transportation for transportation needs, not solely recreation or um, joy riding as um, can sometimes be the case, um, especially for early adopters of programs. So I would encourage you to view this as an investment in the long-term uh, transportation flexibility and sustainability of Burlingame and as a program that can grow um, and increase ridership and increase active transportation mode share in the city of Burlingame. I think another thing to look at is um, speed limits, geographically bounded speed limits, in addition to just no-go zones for these vehicles. You can get um, scooters and e-bikes to slow down um, um, artificially at, in certain locations that you feel 
the need to have them slow down. So um, I would use it. I, I would love for a program of any sort to be in place and would encourage you to maintain as much flexibility as possible in the permits uh, program or in whatever model you uh, create for, for this. Uh, so thank you very much for your Thank you. Next, we have Commissioner, Planning Commissioner Jennifer Fath. Thank you, Megan. Um, so this is very interesting. Um, Sigal, thank you and uh, appreciate all the questions and remarks from all of you. Um, I have more of a, just a nuts and bolts and probably closer to um, uh, Councilwoman, um, um, O'Brien um, with regard to safety issues. And it, it's true, it's not just, these exist already and it's not just the ones that you might or may, may not be getting, but um, specifically wanted to talk about scooters. I, as you know, I do live um, probably about four blocks from town. So these, these are pretty common where I live, um, the scooters are, and also because of the high school. And um, it's just not clear to me um, what, what the rules are. And um, what I'm tending to see are these, they are not necessarily on the sidewalk, but the ones that are on the street are not stopping. So it's just not clear to me, do they have to follow the rules? Like where there's a stop sign, they're supposed to stop or they don't have to stop or they just do a California stop. And they're going really quite fast. And um, I, myself, I was grazed in a side, in a, actually in a um, crosswalk near downtown, just crossing from the station over to, um, I guess it was the Flights restaurant, um, just like grazed. I didn't even see the guy coming and um, just, you know, at a bit a second later, I would have been knocked over. So it, it was really scary because he was going really fast. So um, I'm just concerned. I love the idea that you can fence these sort of electronically, but if you fence too many areas, then it kind of defeats the purpose. So would there be, you know, it's nice to, that the city would not be sued, but what about regular people being hit? Oh, I mean, I, I just, it's just not clear to me how um, altogether the scooters can be controlled a little better. And um, I don't know if that's something else we want to, put on our police department. So it's just a comment and not a judgment one way or the other, but the, the scooters, the electric scooters are definitely an issue for people, for areas that are close to the downtowns. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Emma. Hi, my name is Emma Schles and I'm with commute.org. I'm the TM program manager. Um, so thank you so much for holding the stud study session. And I just wanted to express commute.org support for micro mobility, whether you guys do bikes or scooters or some, some other thing that we haven't thought of yet, but um, the programs help to reduce car trips and that contributes to our mission of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled. So we'd love to help in whatever um, way you guys made sense um, for a program in Burlingame. And um, in particular, we're, we're just starting to look into link, linking any new micromobility programs into our STAR platform, which is where people log trips, log their non-vehicle um, commute trips and you know get points and incentives and stuff. So that's something that we're looking into in the future. And I also wanted to share that I remember when Lime Bikes was here in Burlingame and I thought it was a huge success. I heard a lot of stories of people who didn't have a bike and loved having them available, especially taking the e-bikes from downtown or Caltrain into the hills to go home. So um, I think it would be a, a big success again if you guys had it. So um, that is it. It would be great to see these programs in as many cities as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just check the emails again. Um, Oh, I have one email. Uh, it's from Traffic Safety Parking Commissioner uh, Robalos. He says, I'm very supportive of a shared and easily accessible e-bike share program. I prefer the dockless model for efficiency, but I can see a hybrid model of dockless in residential areas and docked in commercial areas. I think Burlingame is a perfect fit for micro mobility, and I'm hopeful that we get 
something useful in place sooner than later. And I don't have any others, so you're all set. Okay, guys, I'll bring it back to uh, my colleagues for final comments. Uh, does anybody want to start us off? I see Council Member Colson beat the buzzer. I just have a quick question. So um, Commissioner Ravello, Ravellos just mentioned um, hybrid model. Do, do, do we have a hybrid model in this options, Sigal? Is um, there one where you can do some docked and some can go up to your house and back? Because I'm not aware of that. Um, it may exist. I would have to look further and see, you know, if that's happening in other cities. I don't think Bird offers that. Okay. Um, and for the most part, um, I'd have to do more research. Okay, no problem. All right. I, I just wanted to make sure that we were clear that we weren't discussing an option tonight that was a hybrid. So the option tonight is e-bikes docked and e-scooters corralled or docked. And what do we want to pursue? Yes, correct? and it could be that we researched, or I could also we could decide to research and see if such hybrid is okay. available. And it, you know, depending on the approach, you know, potential permit could either direct that or give some flexibility. And you know, and, and Michael could speak to it. But you know, if we get permit applications that we don't like or it doesn't look like a good program, we could deny it, right? So. Okay. Well, great. Yeah. So, so the biggest the biggest question tonight is: Do we want to move forward or not? We could do further study and refinement, but I, I think that we want to talk about if we're in favor of moving forward, what type of vehicles and that. And uh, but so, but yeah, we can refine it later. So I see Council Member Beach. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and I really appreciate the conversation. No surprise, I'd I'd like to pursue further conversations on, on this. Um, my gut instinct is that for, I, th I think, um, for our residents to embrace it, I think dockless would be used more because it, it just is more flexible and can get to and from the neighborhoods. It can get to and from transit. It can address the last mile. I think the technology is exciting that there could be that the corral opportunities without having to put in $20,000 worth of infrastructure if we set aside um, parking spaces or parking areas in parks um, that could solve our problem that we had with line bikes. So I'd like to explore that a little further. I wouldn't be opposed to, to docking stations for a bike share. I'd like to know if there's any dockless bike share programs that exist. It seems that most of them are going to docking stations. Um, I think we should really be in communication with Facebook. I think that's a very important partner right now because there's a huge opportunity to maybe do a program also with them. They might even be interested in a, in a docked program, but uh, particularly as they start to bring their workforce back in, can we ideally get them from downtown Burlingame? That's we'd, we'd prefer they get off at Burlingame Station rather than Millbrae. So they use our downtown, they use our shops. Um, it's only a two mile ride. It's easy. It's like 10, 15 minutes max um, down to the Facebook campus. That might be a wonderful opportunity via scooter or via bike. So I'd like to maybe see if we could partner with them somehow. Um, I think I do hear... Ms. Ms. Faf's comments about the speeds, and it is of concern. I think it's a good reminder, though, a lot of these privately owned scooters and bikes have much different speed limits. So e-bikes can go up to literally 30 miles an hour in some cases, and some even push it. You know, uh, um, bike share is about 20 miles an hour, and that's fast on a bike, but the scooters are 15 miles an hour. You can bike 15 miles an hour, and it, it's not like private scooters can be rigged to go a lot faster. So I think that's something to be in mind. Oh, and the other thing I learned is that the scooters can take 20, de 20 degree hill grades. So they could actually get up our hills too and really help people get from the hills down to uh, our transit hub. So I, you know, I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I think I'm very open-minded about the technology helping us solve some of the problems with that we had with line bike, I would be open to bikes and or scooters and look forward to continuing hopefully the conversation if colleagues agree it's worth um, a, additional conversations. Thanks. Thank you. Council member O'Brien. Yeah, so making this quick, cause I know we have to start our meeting at seven o'clock. Um, 
In regard to the scooters, I don't want to pursue the scooters. I think there's just too many accidents with that. Um, you know, many people don't follow the laws. I'm worried about them being used on the sidewalks uh, and hitting people, um, even if you were using it in the, in the Bayfront. Um, also with Dockless, I don't particularly want to see scooters all over Burlingame. And I think they're even, they're more of a tripping hazard than the bikes. At least the bikes are much bigger and more visible. Um, I am open to the e-bikes. Um, granted, the line bikes, I was not happy about the dockless because they were all over the place, um, many blocking sidewalks. And to me, that becomes, you know, another tripping hazard. However, I was quite pleased on the usage of the bikes. Um, and, and so I, I think if there's ways to kind of control, you know, where these bikes are located, um, you know, at our train stations, at, you know, various parks throughout, you know, the city. So, you know, the hills are taken care of maybe with Cornavaca Park, um, have some at Washington Park. Um, I think Council Member Beach's suggestion on Facebook would actually be interesting, uh, especially when we look forward to development, you know, in that area, those scoot the, sorry, the bikes would come in handy and also people who want to use bikes along the Bay Trail. And um, so that would be kind of a good place to be able to have, you know, a docking station. Um, I'd be interested in finding out Seagal data, maybe from the cities that are already implementing um, the e-bike program on what is going well, what's not going well, and what is the um, usage like? Um, I think, you know, we want to make sure if we're going to pursue this, that, you know, people are going to actually use it. Um, and then also, you know, the, the pricing of the docks or, or do these companies, you know, cover um, that price? I just don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if nobody has any other comments, then I just put mine in. Um, I do believe that we should pursue both uh, bikes and scooters. Um, and I, you know, when we talk a lot about line bikes and line bikes were actually very popular. And after we complained and, uh, um, we, it got back to the company and they actually became a lot better about picking up their bikes and, 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 uh, towards the end of the program, we actually had a lot of, um, very positive feedback from people. And so, the concern I have with the docking stations is that what uh, council member or vice mayor Brown Rick said, it turns into a round trip and then we lose a lot of the uh, functionality. Uh, so what I like about the dock list and what I liked about Linebacks is you can pick it up, drive, take it home and, and they'll pick it up right there or somebody else will come and take it. Um, so that we can address uh, by having multiple racks in the city. So I think that's important that we look at that so that we can use it one way. Uh, and then the scooters, I think it's important that we look at the, uh, the speed so that we can address some of uh, uh, Ms. Fab's concerns because I do, I've been in the same situation where one of them whizzes by me. Uh, and I think the council member Beach uh, said it right, the, uh, the rental ones don't have the speed that the private ones do. So uh, I think that in that respect, but I think we need to investigate that. And, and then about the geolocating, the geofencing, uh, if we can limit the speeds inside downtown, then that would take care of that. So, or limit the speeds where there's pedestrians and where there's uh, other things going on. So I, I do think we need to uh, move forward with this. And I think that we have some uh, additional issues that we need to address, but definitely in favor of it. Uh, I think I saw council member Colson's hand go up. Thanks, sorry, since I asked a question. So I would prefer to start looking with the e-bikes first, see how they go. And then if they do well, we could look at the scooters down the road, but I have big concerns in a small town like ours around the scooters. Um, and I think the e-bikes would transit from um, east-west really well, which is one of our big problems of how to get people around. And um, while I, I, I just think that you're going to have to probably, I've never seen a hybrid and I've been to a lot of cities. I travel a lot. I've never seen a hybrid um, option. So my guess is it's not going to exist unless we invent it. So um, I think it, if that's the case, then I would prefer to go docked only because I think the dock list um, did end up sort of everywhere scattered all around and people, you, you didn't know necessarily 
where one was. You could look on your app and I guess find it, but you still would have to sometimes walk two or three blocks to go pick it up and then go downtown. And I think if there's just, you know, we know there's one at Heritage Park, there's one at, you know, or Pershing Park, there's one at Facebook, we know where they are. I think it's easier for people to just know I got to walk half a block. There'll definitely be a bike, pick it up and go. Very good, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think I, I joined the consensus. I was in favor of line bike back in the day. I, I think it was a great experiment and I'd be happy to reinvestigate this. I do think when it comes back, it would be really good to have those corrals or, or racks located so that we can all kind of see and use our judgment as to whether it's likely to be useful. Um, I also, and I suspect I can speak for everybody, but no one else has addressed this. I'm not really keen on the you on this. I don't believe the city needs to make money on these services. Um, I'm I'm happy with it being a fairly low cost um, entry, but I'm not happy with the city having to pay to put in racks, like twenty thousand dollars for a rack. I don't think that's our job. So one of the nice things about Lime was they covered all those expenses. Um, and certainly, uh, whatever we do, let's make sure we insist on data sharing this time so we know how our citizens are using the service. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, Ms. Goldman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think I heard two council members in favor of scooters, two council members against scooters and one council member who was silent on the scooter question. So I'm wondering if Vice Mayor Brownrigg could just weigh in on that to give us um, some help there. Look at the time. Don't we need to go to the next meeting? In soon, but we still have three minutes by my count. We can stretch so, a little, Mr. Vice Mayor. So I'm, I'm not, um, I, I share the reservations about scooters. I, I, think, um, I think bikes caused a lot less trouble and, and I do worry that people, using them inadvertently on California or El Camino, which already has very high speed traffic, is really asking for trouble. So I'm not, I'm not a big scooter fan, I agree with that. Um, I, you know, I would love to see us put our toe in the water with bikes again, and then um, depending on how they work, look at scooters. I understand uh, Councilwoman Beach's point about you can turn them off, um, but I don't think that addresses Councilwoman uh, O'Brien's point about safety and they just are so exposed and they go so fast and I do worry about people um, hurting themselves. I do. Right. Thank you. And uh, one, one final thought that I have, you mentioned the regional program. If we were part of a regional program, that would make the whole thing a lot smarter and it would make a lot more sense. So if, if there is a regional program, I would defer to that and join with other cities to so we all have the same system. Um, with that, uh, colleagues, any final comments before we adjourn this and go to our regular meeting? So with that, then the study session is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. And I think we should take a, a wait a minute. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, before we start our next session. Okay, one minute. Yeah, so we start at seven. That's fine. I'm not, I haven't, I wasn't planning on starting before then. So I will actually wait till 701, Megan. Ah. <laughs> Even I'm just, better. I'm just feeling wild and crazy today. Yeah, Berkeley,
You can get started when you're ready. Okay, Emily, you're good to do the pledge. Good, all right. Okay, good evening. We are calling the uh, March 7th city council meeting uh, to order at seven, exactly. Oh, there's 701. Um, and with that, we will move on to the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and I've asked uh, council member Beach to lead us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If you're able, please stand and join us and put your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, council member. And with that, we will go to roll call. Um, Madam City Clerk. Council member O'Brien. Present. Council member Beach. Here. Council member Colson. Here. Vice Mayor Brownrigg. I think we lost him during. Oh. He's not here. Bueller. Uh, Mayor Ortiz. Here. And uh, let's see, we're going to go real slow to see if he'll join us again. Uh, so we have a report from our closed session, but we didn't have a closed session, so we don't have a report. And upcoming events, give me just a moment, and I will tell you what the upcoming events is. So mostly it was just announcements that I have. Um, so the Peninsula Library System's annual Young Adult Novelist Convention whew, at the San Mateo Public Library is this Saturday, March 12th at 1 p.m. It's from 1 to 5. And then uh, an announcement that the library is now open Saturdays from 10 to 5 and Sundays from 1 to 5. So that's great news. Thank you. And then uh, from our friends at our Parks and Rec Department, I have give you that one. Um, just a moment. So Ray Park off-leash area is now open for use. Ellie will be very happy. And the recreation program registration is now open for spring classes and summer camps. You need to call 558 7300 or visit registration.burlingame.org for more information. Uh, colleagues, anybody have any, um, any uh, upcoming events they want to share? And having none, then we will move on to presentations, but we don't have any presentations. So now, Mr. Vice Mayor is back yeah so. i'm so sorry i just automatically assumed it was a different like i apologize in terms of upcoming you would just went through the list which i think i missed right did you yes, were just mo mostly announcements we have a uh, uh, the uh peninsula library systems young adult novelist convention we have the libraries now open on weekends from saturday from 10 to 5 and sundays from 1 to 5 and then from the Parks and Rec, we have the fact that Ray Park now is has off the off leash area, and Ray Park is now open. And yeah, we yeah. have the registration uh, classes are uh, for spring are now available. So just to add, although this will we'll have another council meeting in between, but March twenty third at eleven thirty is the unveiling of the Anson Burlingame tribute in Washington Park, and that's an open invitation. Excellent, thank you. That is going to be a fun event. So with that, then we are moving to a public comment. This is public comment for items that are not on the agenda. And so I will hand it to our city clerk. Yes, we do have one from Terry Nagel, our former mayor. Good evening, Mayor Ortiz and council members. I'm here to thank the many people who have reached out to the Burlingame Neighborhood Network to express their sorrow at hearing of Suzanne Tadeosian's untimely death. Suzanne was an exceptional person who contributed greatly to the resilience of our community during her many years on our Burlingame Neighborhood Network board. You know, she worked with block leaders, managed our emergency cash program, helped organize ham radio communicators, and she played a huge role in our annual emergency drills. In fact, she was planning to present the program on the Zello emergency app that we're offering this Thursday evening. 
Suzanne and her husband, Jeff, have consistently been some of the kindest and most generous members of our community. When a call goes out for volunteers, they've always been among the first to raise their hands. Many people have asked us if they can contribute to something in Suzanne's memory, and our BNN board is discussing ways to honor her with Jeff. If you would like to donate to the Suzanne Taddy Ocean Memorial Fund, please go to our website at burlingamenetwork.org and click on donate at the top. All contributions are tax deductible. We will acknowledge your gift promptly and notify Suzanne's family of your kindness and generosity. Thank you again for this outpouring of sympathy for Suzanne. Thank you, Mayor Nagel. I uh, appreciate the uh, comment. We are planning to adjourn in her memory. So we appreciate the, uh, your comments and our thoughts are with Jeff and the children. So um, thank you for that comment. Uh, we're moving on to um, Madam City Clerk. I'm sorry. Any other comments? No, that was the only one. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to item number eight, which is the approval of the consent calendar. Colleagues, do I have anybody want to pull any of the items on the consent agenda? I have an agenda item to pull. Yes, uh, Madam City Clerk, I don't think I was asking you, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> A member of the public would like to pull item 8E. 8E, perfect. Okay, so uh, Vice Mayor Brandrig. If I might, I'd also like to briefly um, pull 8G. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, having none others, then I will open it to public comment for any members of the public who wish to pull any of the agenda items. We already have one. Anybody else? No. Nope. Nope. So moving on, I'll bring it back to my colleagues. Uh, uh, colleagues, I'd entertain a motion for items 8A, 8A, B, C, D, F, H, so moved. Second. Motion by Council Member O'Brien, second by Council Member Colson. Uh, could we have a roll call, please? Council Member O'Brien. Uh, Council Member Beach. Yes. Council Member Colson. Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Yes. Mayor Ortiz. Aye. And with that, then we will move on to item number 8E. And I believe it was a member of the public who pulled that one. So I will. So I'll read uh, an email we received from Minito. He says, thank you very much for putting this item on the agenda for clarity and to wrap up the Broadway interchange project that had its ribbon cutting and open for service day on a windy September day in 2017. It's in the city's best interest to have this all cleared and squared away even five years later. I'm hoping the clarity includes answers to the following questions. Who is responsible for sweeping the bike lanes on the overpass? It's typically littered with fenders, hubcaps, glass from crashes, and other types of debris. It's a safety and liability issue. The signal at the long northbound 101 off-ramp that ends at the intersection of Old Bay Shore by Max's Diner needs a right turn green era. All the other off-ramps like at Peninsula and at Millbrae allow drivers to turn with a green era. Here, Burlingame drivers are forced to legally have to come to a complete stop, even when there's no conflicting movement. I'm hoping this can be changed to allow continuous legal right turns to benefit all residents trying to get to their homes. There is a way to adjust the lane stripes and arrows to make this happen and improve traffic flow and compliance. Otherwise, the vast majority of Burlingame drivers are forced to break the law. It'll be even worse when top golf traffic comes in. Uh, the signal coming up from southbound 101 onto Broadway is supposed to be a no turn on red, but often drivers turn right on red or pressure the drivers in front of them to do so. This needs another signal on the far right hand side so it's clear what drivers are expected to do. Four, the signal at Bayshore and Airport is not in Caltrans right of way and is clearly and squarely within the city boundaries. It's not clear why that intersection needs to be in the MOU. The city should have full control and authority of that signal. Five, I know this agreement meets with the state's approvals. I just want to make sure it also accounts for what's in the best interest of the city. It's in the city's fiduciary interest to make sure all the re uh, recitals and all these details don't put the city in the, don't put the city in the best spot possible and not 
have to spend Burlingame taxpayer money to fix things that should have been fixed earlier as has already happened. Lastly, Mr. Oma Shockin is no longer the head of Caltrans. He's been appointed to a higher office over a month ago, so probably is not the best name to be signatory to the agreements. Um, and then he includes a picture of most of you at the ribbon cutting ceremony, which I will forward for memories. Very good, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and then uh, I guess now we, uh, any questions, comments from colleagues, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor? Well, I have two uh, questions, Mr. Mayor. One is, are we going to respond uh, to those comments or how do we respond to those comments? Is, do, are we going to try to write answers to them? Or uh, that's, that's a question about Mr. Manito's commentary. I had a couple of questions of my own. So let, let's address that one real quick. Uh, my sense is that there's some detailed information that needs an educated response. So, uh, I think the I, ideal would be that Mr. Mertusa uh, or was somebody in his staff respond to it, but I will let Mr. Mertusa answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, I will be happy to respond to some respond to some of the questions uh, regarding the street <coughs> sweeping on the overpass. That would be City of Burlingame would be responsible for that. The traffic signals at Old Bayshore intersection in front of Max's Cafe that is uh, Caltrans uh, maintained traffic signal. And then the traffic signals at the off-ramp, southbound off-ramp and on-ramp, they're all Caltrans traffic signals. The issue about uh, traffic making a right turn at that intersection uh, and then um, um, turning, um, you know, the information about uh, upcoming traffic signal, staff has communicated that issue to Caltrans and Caltrans uh, uh, has not been able to respond to that. There has been, or my understanding is that Caltrans has uh, told our staff that they are looking into it. And similarly, there's a, a concern regarding staff, um, concerns regarding traffic making left turns at that southbound off, off ramp and uh, building up and um, into those two left turn lanes at that intersection. Uh, so again, Caltrans is aware of that. And uh, we have not been able to, uh, you know, see the timeline as to when that those uh, issues will be uh, addressed by Caltrans. Finally, the traffic signals at Airport Boulevard and uh, Broadway intersections, that, and um, that is actually uh, maintained by Caltrans. That is because Caltrans wants to ensure that there is no traffic buildup uh, in those two left turn, two left turn lanes going at the northbound on ramp. So. Uh, they wanted to have more uh, more control over that uh, because not having control over that signal um, and uh, that may create problem for the um, workings of those traffic signal at the on-ramp as well as the airport boulevard intersection. So uh, those are my responses at this time. Thank you, uh, Director Mertuza. Appreciate the uh, responses. And with that, um, um, Vice Mayor, you said you had other comments? I have two questions that I, I would like to pose of my own. One, because this item is on our agenda, I'm allowed to ask Director Mertuza what I've asked before, which is when are they going to finish their landscaping um, obligations? Uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg, a great question. In fact, uh, Council Member Bija also had reached out to me earlier this evening. And uh, my understanding is that Caltrans has, uh, uh, Caltrans in cooperation with the Transportation Authority is doing the uh, final um, design that the project uh, that landscaping project is in the final design and they're supposed to go out to bid this year uh, because of COVID uh, the project was delayed uh, and um, I have reached out to the transportation authority earlier this evening have not gotten any update but my last uh, conversation I had with them was that they are looking to get that project into construction this uh, later this year. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, we could have had a small forest by now if they had done this, um, you know, more or less when we thought they might. But um, I do think we want to make sure we hold their feet to the fire. I know this is not their highest priority. And I know that the project as a whole went over budget. So they're, you know, everyone's a little bitter whenever that happens. But this is an obligation and it will significantly improve that intersection for residents and visitors. 
Uh, my other question, um, you know, I had hoped uh, that one of the side benefits of doing the um, Broadway grade separation would be depressing the roadway, which would then allow us to revisit some of the striping on the road to the overpass. Um, that obviously is not going to happen for lots of good reasons. You know, yay that we don't have to depress the road, but now we're, we're sort of stuck with it. I personally find the way the lane striping was done to be very challenging. Um, it is almost too wide, it seems to me. There are too many ways to get on to 101 southbound if you're going east on Broadway. Uh, I just feel like um, the whole thing, and, and not to mention there's no sidewalk uh, next to Rector Audi and people are trying to bike there. And uh, it, it feels to me like a, it could use a rethink. And I don't know whether there's a chance to do that, Director Mertuza. Obviously there's a question of who would pay for it and all that stuff. But um, I just wanted to voice, you know, it's very difficult when you're looking at an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and you're looking at lines to tell. But to me, it's a very difficult set of lanes, frankly. So I just wanted to share that observation. Thank you. If I may respond uh, to that, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that the, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. There are opportunities to reconfigure the lane lines there. And uh, we were hoping that uh, when we have any opportunities as part of future improvements on Broadway, whether it's a resurfacing project or, or a um, say grade separation project, even without depressing the road, uh, that will present opportunities to reconfigure um, those lane lines. And uh, as you may recall that as part of the Broadway grade separation, we are looking at a, a class one bike facility there, a separated facility right under the bridge between uh, California Drive and Carolyn Avenue. However, uh, further down east uh, from that side, that's still an opportunity for us to re redraw the st striping lanes to see what we can do to, uh, to improve that buffer between the pedestrians and the motorists as well as the bicyclists. So uh, that is definitely not forgotten. I just want you to know that we definitely are aware of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Beach. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just two brief comments, and I really appreciate Director Matuza's um, responses to the great questions from the Vice Mayor. We do f hear a lot of feedback that um, constituents are it, find it to be a very confusing intersection. Of course, the grade set will help with that, but yes, the striping as well. It's, that's great that it's on staff's radar. I just wanted to uh, appreciate uh, 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 Mr. Velesco's comments as well. I do think um, I ride the bike lanes across Broadway about 50% of the time and the other 50% of the time I'm in the bike ped um, overpass, the Rosalie O'Mahony bike pass, but I use both. And, and I do think we could do a better job if we were responsible for the sweeping of those bike lanes on the overpass. It does have a lot of debris and can be kind of, uh, kind of dicey for cyclists. So thanks so much for, uh, for, for him bringing that up tonight. Great, thank you. Um... Thank you. Uh, and so I, I, yeah, I have to agree with the landscaping that I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's really important that we push them a little bit on that. And I, I agree with the restriping It's a little odd and I look forward to having it reconfigured. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, with that and no further comments from my colleagues and I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve Mr. Mayor. So. And I'll second Beach. Okay, so we have a motion by Vice Mayor Brownrigg and a second by Council Member Beach. Uh, if we could have a roll call, please, Madam City Clerk. Council Member O'Brien. I know you're saying yes, but I can't hear. Yes. Not, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, now I can. I was like, I can see her mouth moving. Um, Council Member Beach. Yes. Council Member Colson. Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Yes. Mayor Ortiz. Aye. Okay, and having that, now we'll, we'll move on to item number 8G, which is the adoption of resolution approving the installation of two public art projects. And I believe that was the vice mayor who pulled that. And, and really to be very quick, because uh, time is precious, I wanted to thank our city librarian for this initiative. I, I know I'm not the only one, but I am a huge believer in the importance of public art. Uh, and I really appreciate 
uh, the librarian bringing art to the inside and the outside of the library. And I can't help but say again how useful I think it might be to have some sort of group <laughs> in the city, a commission or something that was sort of responsible for driving art. But in the meantime, let's hear it for uh, everyone doing an individual effort. Thank you, Mr. Librarian. You're very welcome, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, it fell into our laps. I'm, we're happy to do it though. Our, our board of trustees was super happy to have it fall into our laps. So um, we, we are lovers of art as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCullough. Um, anybody else have any comments, any questions? And if not, then we could uh, go ahead and open it to the members of the public. Um, I don't have any emails and I don't see anyone with their hand up. So Thank you very you, much. Just kidding. We have a uh, trustee member, Mike Nagler. Welcome, Mr. Nagler. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm certainly glad this is being considered. I hope it goes through in a timely fashion. Uh, we've had a couple of discussions about this at board meetings, and we're all huge fans of public art. And I'm glad that the public library has been able to help to spearhead this movement in Burlingame. I just think public art is so important to a community, and I don't frankly think there's enough of it in Burlingame, and I'm glad we can do our small part. So thanks for considering all this, folks. Thank you, Mr. Nagler, and we're working on it. So with that, I'll bring it back to my colleagues for any final comments. And if we don't have any final comments, I'll bring it back, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the um, acceptance of the art. I'll second. So we have a motion by Council Member Colson, a second by Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Uh, if we could have a roll call, please. Council Member O'Brien? Yes. Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg? Yes, enthusiastically. <laughs> Mayor Ortiz? I enthusiastically. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we're moving on now to public hearings. We don't have any public hearings, so we move on to item number 10, which is staff reports. And we're going to 10A, which is our housing element annual progress report. Uh, and I believe that is our Director Gardner. Take it away, Mr. Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mayor Ortiz and uh, members of the council. Good evening. Um, as mentioned, this is our annual housing element uh, progress report. And then this year, we're also adding a housing program discussion uh, as we are on the eve of our new housing element update and also um, would like to get some direction on housing funds. Uh, so there's really three parts to this, present, uh, to this presentation. Uh, the first is the review of the 2021 Housing Element Annual Report, or APR as it's known. Next up is a initial discussion of housing element policies and programs to be considered um, as we look at our housing element update. And then the third piece is discussing potential uses and allocations of housing funds. And um, initially I was going to suggest that we take these each as you know, almost three separate agenda items. However, um, we do want to obviously um, fit the uh, open to public comment and that would be hard to do through time. So uh, what I can do is go through each, you know, part one, two, and three, and then perhaps that's how the conversation is structured, um, but, uh, but also uh, provide the opportunity to hear from the public. So part one, uh, the 2021 Housing Element Annual Progress Report. Uh, you may recognize these um, rather squinty, cryptic forms. Um, these are the forms that we are obligated to use by the State Housing and Community Development Department. Um, they are not so much user friendly, but are quite uh, useful for recording data. So what we try to do is summarize what's in these forms, both in the staff report, as well as this is probably the best cheat sheet. There's a summary form at the very end, which uh, auto populates with all the relevant numbers, uh, but I'll also go through those in these, uh, in these slides. 
Uh, the way the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or RENA as it's commonly called, R-H-N-A, um, it's pronounced RENA, uh, it's measured by building permits issued. And um, fortunately, in more recent years, they've also provided the, the mechanism to allow us to count uh, or start counting uh, projects that are in the pipeline. So have either have entitlements or have had applications um, because it is a long process to get through to the building permits. But when it comes down to actually counting a unit towards our RENA allocation, um, it is measured by building permits. That's when the state really considers that the unit is going to be built and, and um, able to be occupied. Uh, in this past year, 2021, 474 new net building permits were issued. And that brings us to a grand total for this housing element cycle to 1,222 units. And the current cycle is from 2015 to 2021. This is our last year for, for this cycle. Um, now our, our requirement was only 863 units. So we have now surpassed the total number of units required for our RENA 5 or, or the 2015 to 2021 cycle. Um, it's, we're now at 141.6% fulfilling. And one thing that's important to look at, and particularly in this, this last cycle, is of all of those units, um, more than 18% are affordable to below market um, households, either moderate, low, very low, or extremely low incomes. We do also keep a monthly total. So if people are wanting to uh, not wait a whole year for this report, and ideally, um, Hopefully this is a little more user friendly. Uh, we list out all of the uh, projects that are in the pipeline, both approved uh, as well as under review. We have uh, information pages for pretty much all of the projects. So there's a hyperlink on there. And this report can be downloaded each month from berlingame.org slash major projects. So highlights of 2021, as mentioned, 346 units were entitled. 474 building permits were issued. Um, of those, 53 are below market rate units. There were also 73 accessory dwelling units that were received, and of those, 52 have been approved so far with building permits. And there's 807 additional units in progress. Um, now, one bright spot with uh, looking at our next housing element update in the cycle is that any of these units that are in the pipelines, that's the 346 units that are entitled, it's the 807 units in progress, those all count towards our next cycle. So uh, they roll over and, um, and our next cycle is quite a bit higher, it's 3,257 units, but uh, if you add what we already have in progress, we're already uh, a good ways towards that, that goal. What we will ask for, this is the more formal part. So I've just put this up as a cheat sheet is we do need a motion um, at the end of this item to accept that annual housing element progress report and authorize the transmittal uh, to the governor's office of planning and research and the um, HCD. Part two is our initial discussion of housing element policies and programs to be considered in the housing element update. And this gives us an opportunity to roll out our snazzy new logo for the housing element. Uh, you'll see it looks sort of familiar if you remember our Envision Berlin game logo, which is our train station. We've now added housing, but the point is that this is part of the general plan, part of Envision Berlin game. And in fact, what Envision Berlin game really did was set us up very well for this upcoming housing cycle in providing uh, the uh, development capacity that we need to reach those 3,257 um, opportunity units. Um, this is our land use map from the uh, general plan. And um, Berlin game is unique um, in that we don't need to spend as much time looking at where to put the housing. That's, that hard work's already been done as part of the general plan update. Uh, it's not to say that we can't come up with new ideas and say what about, you know, and, and suggest some other ideas, but uh, we're not having the same conversations that other communities are having where um, they're really trying to figure out where do you 
put a couple thousand more units. Uh, the general plan does have that capacity already. So what that allows us to do is talk about policies and programs. Uh, we do see that as the uh, main discussion points for our community outreach. And this is our schedule for community outreach over the next two months. We're gonna start with a pop-up event at the Fresh Market in downtown Burlingame on March 20th. That's a Sunday morning. Um, we'll have a table there with our outreach consultants, MIG. Uh, then we'll have a community meeting over Zoom on March 23rd, and we'll discuss a number of things, including what is uh, RENA and, um, and talking about sites in case anybody does want to look at sites, and then, and then the ideas of policies and programs. Uh, I do see a hand up from Vice Mayor Brown Reagan. and I'm uh, happy to take questions as I go along. Is that all right with you, Mr. Mayor? I'm sorry, yes, please, by all means. So I, I didn't want to stop the flow, but I, I was uncertain when I read the rep staff report and, and, and here's the right place to ask, which is what is our messaging with this public outreach? Um, what, are, what are we trying to get across to people and what input are we hoping for? Because our general plan is done, we're implementing, we're executing, so I guess I was a little bit unclear as to what we were asking the public or if we were telling the public. It's a bit of both. Some of it is telling the public um, because, you know, they may have read news reports or heard stories of, of you know, where does housing go you know, with, with the new housing element update cycle. So we do want to convey that uh, the heavy lifting has been done. It's uh, been we do have direction of where, where that housing can go. Uh, we do want to ask if that's, we don't really want to completely reopen the general plan, but we, you know, we would like to confirm that that is the direction we're going. And then it really gets down to more policies and programs. And, you know, what's tricky is, you know, how do you, you want to describe housing policies and programs in a way that um, makes sense to people. Uh, you know, it's, it's very, kind of bureaucratic to talk about policies and programs. So are there things that the city can be doing to make housing work better for the community, for people that live here, work here? Um, certainly we know there are concerns about affordability and are there, you know, what are what are some things that, that um, we might be able to do as programs um, that could um, help with, uh, with concerns that people have over housing? So it is a little different discussion. It's it's not um, looking at the maps and putting stickers on necessarily as much as um, what are the kinds of things that the city can do to, um, you know, and ideally address housing needs for those who are maybe not addressed currently. Thank you. I may come back to that, but I appreciate um, that color. Thank you. Sure. And and we welcome that kind of that. That's partly why we want to have this discussion with the council prior to doing the outreach is to get feedback on what we should be discussing. Are there programs and policies that we uh, might wanna be suggesting to the public and, and kind of uh, using that as a vetting process um, and, and receiving that feedback. Uh, I see a hand up from council member O'Brien. Uh, yes, um, through the mayor, um, Director Gardner, I think the um, date for the annual joint Council planning meeting oh, should be the 23rd. You are correct, thank you. Uh, that is the 23rd. Uh, we will uh, not have a meeting on Sunday, I promise. Thank you. Uh, so what community meeting, uh, meeting number one will discuss is, is some of what we've just mentioned here is to really lay out, you know, for people that are starting from scratch, what is the housing element? What is the update? Um, explaining Burlingame's um, particular situation and, and having already zoned land for um, what, what we're uh, required to make provisions for, but then also asking what are things that could be done um, that would make uh, housing better for the residents as well as, as people that uh, would be working here in Burlingame. We'll have a pop-up uh, meeting on Broadway, which will be similar to the one uh, at the fresh market, but we do want to reach the other neighborhoods in town. Um, and our guess is having had a community meeting before that, we will get different kinds of feedback 
uh, particularly if somebody's been to the community meeting, they could then still come to the pop-up with, with um, other ideas that they've thought of. Community meeting number two is a reporting back and is meant to uh, report what we've heard and try to start gelling some of the, the ideas, uh, particularly regarding policies and programs, things the city can be doing. Um, if there is interest in, in uh, different sites or different types of housing, um, we can report on that as well. And then on April 23rd um, will be the annual joint city council planning commission meeting where um, both the city council planning commission can reflect on what we've heard in the outreach and, and um, provide us more refined feedback on, on the specifics of our housing element. So our annual progress report does include um, probably the lengthiest table is table D, which has all of the current policies, uh, or sorry, these are all of the programs from the housing element. And in the far right-hand column, we report on the progress that we've had. Uh, some of these have already been, um, the, the programs have been concluded or, or the goals have been set. Others are still ongoing and still others you know, now looking eight years later, they, uh, they may need to be tweaked or refined. This is often a starting off place, but there may be other programs and policies that were never considered eight years ago and are the kinds of things that we wanna be looking at in this housing element update. So that is part two of our part three uh, uh, trifecta here. Uh, the part three that we would like to discuss with the city council is the uh, potential uses and allocations of housing funds. Uh, the housing fund is developed from the commercial linkage mm -hmm. fees that were adopted in 2017. Uh, we do also have residential impact fees. However, without exception, all of the projects so far have taken the option of instead providing units on site. Um, and that was in fact a a goal from at least you know a number of the council members to tip the balance of the fees so that it would be uh, more tempting to build the units on site and then we would have those units and in fact um, they are in our pipeline now. However, we have also been able to uh, collect funds through the commercial linkage fees. There is currently uh, three three million eight hundred eighty six thousand seven hundred twenty four dollars in the housing fund account. And then with two more projects coming in in the next one or two years, uh, we anticipate it a um, little more than 5 million um, in addition to that. Um, so we're starting to build up a, a good amount. This is not even including projects that are currently under review, such as the uh, numerous life science projects over on the Bayfront. Um, those are, this is just, these are funds that are coming in that are from approved projects that, that are pretty much certain to be uh, coming in. Uh, we started a discussion in 2019 with the city council about um, possible use of funds and, and coming up with a plan. Um, you'll recall that we had a consultant, Bill Lowell, who had been with the San Mateo County Department of Housing, was giving us guidance and recommended adopting guiding principles with a list of eligible uses. Uh, maybe not trying to get too specific in that you want some flexibility as, as things change. Um, and then the, the direction to completely oversimplify this was to um, pursue both emergency rent assistance as well as support trying to get to the lower income housing categories that at that time um, the, the city had not been able to get uh, as well in, in its projects. Uh, fast forward to today, uh, we are looking at updating our commercial fee linkage, uh, commercial linkage fee study. Uh, we actually started doing that in late 2019, right before uh, COVID hit. We put that on hold, uh, given the uncertainty with the market. Uh, now, uh, in, in recent months, given the strength of the market that we're seeing, we've uh, reopened that and been talking to our consultant to get that study uh, updated again with current market conditions. What we've also seen, which maybe we hadn't anticipated back in 2019, was that we are seeing more in the low income category with new developments, and that would be the 80% AMI category. 
Um, up until a few years ago, we were just seeing units in the moderate income category, which goes up to 120% of area median. Um, but changes to state density bonus law um, really have driven the inclusion that um, it's, it's almost a sweet spot with the, the development performance that with that lower income category, there's a higher bonus and that seems to work really well with uh, the densities and construction values and, and land values. Uh, so that's, that's a bright spot. Uh, there is still a challenge to reach the very low and extremely low income categories. Uh, the village of Burlingame is, is uh, definitely doing a great job with that. And um, the city subsidized that with the, the cost of the land, which is not insignificant, of course. Um, and generally those, uh, those categories do take some sort of subsidy in the future. And that, that's part of uh, the discussion we wanna have here. Uh, as mentioned in the staff report, there have been a couple of uh, affordable housing projects that are being proposed and each of them, they're not relying necessarily on receiving housing funds, but they have asked. And that has made us think that it's time to reopen that discussion that we started in 2019 and uh, perhaps not have the whole discussion tonight, obviously, but maybe map out a process for um, how do we want to go about setting those guiding principles and, and uh, perhaps there's an allocation of, of units versus programs or, or what have you, um, but, but really uh, start that conversation again. So that's a whole lot. It's really three items in one. Um, we can go back to the slides during the discussion and, uh, and uh, perhaps take them in, in you know, individual pieces, but also with an opportunity for the public to provide testimony as well. So with that, uh, we can start with questions or uh, certainly right. it's through the mayor and, and with the pleasure of the mayor, how you, you would like to-, to Thank you, uh, Director Gardner. I'm gonna ask colleagues that we, uh, I just wanna ask that we be real careful here and that we just ask questions right now and leave comments for uh, after we have the public comment. Uh, then what I would like to do is go uh, point by point when we're done with our questions when, after the public comment, and then we can have our conversations about each one of the points so that we don't, because uh, yeah, it's getting me a little confused. So um, with that, I'll open it up for questions. I see Council Member Colson. Thank you. Um, so my first question is, do the um, RENA numbers, if we exceed our RENA number in this cycle, Kevin, does it roll, do our RENA numbers that we're meeting, do they roll over to the next cycle? or are they cumulative? Uh, they are They are generally um, cumulative. Part of, some of them do roll over and some are cumulative. So the building permits that are issued, um, once they're issued, they're counted. Uh, so those do not roll over. However, uh, the projects that are uh, in progress right now, so those are either uh, proposed but not yet entitled or entitled um, but not yet received their building permits, uh, those do roll over. Okay, so even with the excess and then looking at our new arena, we seem to be in good shape based on our general plan. Okay. Yes, I would say even with, yes, yes, even, even with uh, the rollover is a bonus, uh, but the general plan already anticipated you know, a lot of, a lot of this, uh, growth already. And then my second question has to do with, um, the income related, the income standards. Um, so we have income levels that we're targeting, but there's no sort of definition in there about like people that might be unhoused or, uh, people that might have developmental or other type of, um, unique abilities that might need special housing. How, how does that factor in? So where there's, there's a couple of places. Uh, first, that could factor in with um, policies and programs. So um, in this upcoming housing element update, if that were to be a, a priority, then um, we could really tailor some programs and policies to meet the needs uh, of the households with, uh, with disabilities and special needs. Um, they, uh, depending on their income categories, they may also be captured under the, the different income categories. Um, so so it's, it, it is a combination. The income categories cover one aspect of the housing 
situation and market, but not everything. So uh, the housing element really needs to, to look beyond just those income categories and, and look at um, special needs that can include um, both uh, those with disabilities, as, as mentioned, it can also include um, families, it can include um, uh, senior citizens. It, it's, if you think of any, any of the kind of special needs um, within the community, um, that's where housing programs and policies can um, really be responsive. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So forgive me, uh, Director Gardner, I can't remember if this was a conversation that council had or that maybe we had an economic subcommittee or maybe I had with a housing person. I had so many conversations about housing, but I wanted to check one comment that I believe was made um, and, uh, to me, and that was that when you take funds from a project developer for affordable housing, one is required to use them within five years or else they might get clawed back. Is that the case? As we think about how to use this money, I just think we should be aware if that's the case. I believe that is the case. Uh, it's similar to, um, to other fees that are collected um, in that, um, that that does apply. So uh, they need to be used or assigned um, I know that's something that uh, Hart had been looking at in terms of their trust fund that cities could loan funds to Hart, uh, which which could possibly address that issue. And uh, with the understanding, they would be brought back uh, when there's an eligible project. Uh, but that is something we need to think about as uh, as some of those funds. Uh, um, most of them have been collected within the last two years, I would say, but uh, we do want to think about what we do uh, so that we don't lose this. Well, and actually seeing my colleague, uh, Councilman Colson put her hand up, of course, triggers now where we heard this. This was in our meeting with the school district, and that's where that um, comment was made. So I, to be honest, was not aware of that re restriction, and I think we need to be quite mindful of it because um, we all know how slow it is to put money to work in the housing sector. So I think that's something that um, we definitely want to keep an eye on. And I had another question and it's gone. So I'm going to hand over the mic back. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. And I see Council Member Colson. Yeah, I just um, adding on just to help out on this a little bit, Kevin, through the Housing and Community Development Committee on which I serve um, for the county as the council representative with Ron Collins, um, that is one of the, when we're doing the NOFAs and looking through all the funds from the state and then the federal, the state, and then the county, that, that conversation was, does come into play around people needing to get their, their funds out and cities needing to get their partnering funds out. So I, I think it is, I think I can confirm from that it is about five years. Thank you. Okay, we're back to Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Sorry, I just remembered my other question. Is there a way, Director Gardner, for us to start tracking, you know, RENA and, and everything is pushed as, you know, appropriately towards construction. How many are we building? What, you know, what stage is it in the process and so forth? But I think we've all acknowledged over the years that we are also concerned about de facto affordable housing possibly going offline as older buildings get bought. And I wonder, so my question is, is there a way for us to start collecting data on, on that phenomenon, on units that are going out of circulation. And if there isn't, if we're not doing it now, is there a way that we could start doing it? Because I think, I think the state needs to pay attention to this. I think we've all said at every city meeting I've been at with other cities that we should all get credit for preserving existing affordable units, not just be forced to build new ones. And so I'm wondering if we can contribute to that data gathering in some way. Um, maybe that's not a question and maybe it's a comment, I'm not sure. But anyway, I, I wanted to put that on the table here in our housing report. It's not only building, it's also preserving. Thank you. Director, you wanna make a comment on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I will say we don't, uh, currently we do track if it's, if units are removed as part of a development, then uh, we do record those because 
we're looking at net increases. So we do need to report um, if we've lost housing units in the process of gaining them in an individual project. Um, we don't see a whole lot of that in that um, most of the new units being built are in areas where uh, they're replacing non-residential development, um, commercial or uh, industrial development. Um, there are some instances where, where some units are, are replaced with, with the multi-units. Uh, but if we wanted a more uh, robust monitoring program, that's something we can look at as, as a program to develop um, in our housing element. Thank, Thank you. I, I know Councilman O'Brien has her hand up. All I meant is it's not just net for net, it's also losing affordable units that then become market rate units. Yeah. Right, that's a different kind of transition. But thank you. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction. I appreciate that comment. So, uh, Council Member O'Brien. Yeah, so actually, my question was in regards to preservation because that's something I have brought up multiple times um, over the years because we have a tendency to focus on all the new buildings, um, but we have a very large, um, older stock of um, housing, which most of it's under rent control because the buildings are over um, 15 years old. So they are probably more affordable, uh, many of them, um, compared to the new buildings. And so do we have to define, you know, if we go the direction to use money toward preserving, do we have to define how we're going to preserve and, and what types of programs we would utilize um, to use that money? Uh, I think we just generally say it's for preserving and determine um, those options later on down the road. I think you can, um, yeah, kind of put it in a basket of uh, funds for preserving what's called naturally affordable housing. That, that's the term that, that's been used. And there is a lot in Burlingame. Part of our uh, background for the housing element um, was a, uh, there's a new requirement um, with this cycle called affirmatively furthering fair housing. And um, it did look at the existing market rents in Burlingame and um, they are moderate generally, um, naturally moderate um, because they are older units. They tend to not be um, the high rents that you get on the, the brand new shiny new projects. Um, and you know, back to Vice Mayor uh, Brandrig's comment, we're, we're not really tracking if, for example, a building gets rehabilitated and then the rents are, you know, raise up because um, the building's been improved. Um, there have been discussions in the past where, um, and, and this could be a policy and program, um, both in the housing element and also with the use of the linkage fees is, um, is to somehow um, preserve some of that naturally affordable housing. Um, whether it's through some of the ideas that have been discussed have been um, possibly in, uh, in conjunction with a, a seismic retrofit program, uh, an electrification or energy efficiency program as such. Um, and that could be um, a useful use of those funds and also meet the needs of, of households in Burlingame. Um, we wouldn't necessarily be able to count those units towards um, regional housing needs assessment numbers, but you know that's part of the whole package with a housing element update. Is you know on the one hand, Rena kind of has you studying for the test, and you're just focusing on the numbers, but you really want to look at the full picture. So even if maybe we're not counting those in our numbers, that is a good use of funds, and it's supporting households here in Burlingame. Yeah, and it's almost like Rena is flawed and it should be looking at net new. Uh, so that's a really good point. Thank you uh, both. Uh, Council Member Beach. I, I, wait, I'm not done with my question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so it's actually kind of unfortunate you can't use that toward your arena numbers if there were agreements, you know, with landlords that they keep, you know, if there was money utilized to kind of upgrade units that in return they keep the um, rents within a certain um, range um, so that at least, you know, tenants know it's going to be, you know, rent increases are going to be limited, even though they're limited already under rent control, but there may be landlords that keep them below that, you know, if they get some help to upgrade. 
So it, it is a little unfortunate we can't use those toward um, RENA because then we can maybe get some low income uh, in those categories. Um, and then my final question for now is, I knew there was that time period, I just didn't know how many years, so let's say the five years, is that allotting the money or using the money during that time period? Because you know, we always know that things take longer than expected to you know, be accomplished. I believe it's allotting the money um, because, and, and I'm kind of looking at council member Colson as well, since uh, I'm seeing her nodding because as yes, uh, some of these, as we've seen with the village, it, it takes quite a quite a while to get these projects off the ground. But um, I think it, it is basically assigning or allotting the money um, so that it's uh, it is being used for a purpose um, and and uh, and is assigned to a project that that uh, we anticipate happening. Great, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Beach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, I'm just. Um, Following up with some great comments that uh, Council Member um, O'Brien brought up, I just want to make sure I have an understanding, Director Gardner. So it sounds like we could use some of these affordable housing funds to to invest in uh, preservation of naturally affordable, if we wanted, but we wouldn't achieve any um, impact on our arena numbers. Is that correct? But we could still use it to to a, to preserve the naturally affordable. It's just that we wouldn't get that check block. Is that correct? That's correct. So yeah, because Rena is really focused on new uh, production the new units, and right. increasing okay. units. And, you know, that's, so the goal there is to address housing supply, uh, but there's more to life than housing supply. That's obviously very important, okay. but um, what the, um, the terms of the commercial linkage fees is that they are used to support um, housing that's needed for the workforce. Um, so, although that could imply new units, it could also uh, it could also imply rents that are affordable to those who are taking jobs in Burlingame. Um, so, uh, the preserving naturally affordable housing would address um, the need to continue to have rents that are affordable to the workforce. Okay, and, th and therefore even some of those units that are affordable that are rolling off, we could subsidize to keep them affordable. So we could continue investing um, in those ways. And so uh, again, following up on one of the questions about um, certain uh, safety benefits or improvements on those naturally affordable housing, like we've talked about seismic retrofit, which could be really expensive. I recall pre-COVID, we had a working group that was a stakeholder group that was starting to kind of have a conversation about what that might look like. Has that continued at all or does that need to be restarted or where are we at? It, because I think it is related to this conversation. Could you just give us a very high level overview? It is, yes. So uh, we've had a soft story building working group, if, if that's what you're referring to. Yes, and I couldn't think of that term. Thank you. Sure. And, uh, and we've had three meetings and, and have discussed this. Um, the last meeting we had uh, late last year was to review um, possible incentives and uh, looking at the costs of retrofits and how a uh, owner may be, um, uh, may see the value in, in uh, doing the retrofit or um, ability to pursue one if, if maybe they were didn't have the cash on hand. Um, and then perhaps the city could um, in exchange have a proportion, a portion of the units remain affordable, maybe not the whole building, but um, so that is a group they continue to meet. Um, and and um, it, we, we have been, we're kind of juggling a lot of things. So I think the housing element has, has kind of gotten in the way of that, but um, that that's very much geared towards um, what we're discussing here. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Any other questions, colleagues? Um, having none, then we will open it to public comment. Um, Madam City Clerk. Sure. Uh, we'll start with uh, Planning Commissioner Jennifer Bath. Thanks, Megan. Um, I love the conversation with the preservation of um, naturally affordable 
Is that what you said? Units? I don't know. I'm sorry. The, the older, the older structures, there's a lot of them. And um, I'm, I'm a little confused. Um, why would these count if, for example, um, when a lot of those buildings came up in the 50s and 60s, um, apartments were generally, many of them were larger. And um, would it count if a three bedroom, two bath, um, or a three bedroom, one bath were um, reconfigured to be um, two units and you're adding a bathroom or whatever it should be, would those units, if you, if you, you know, added a third more units in a complex that had maybe, I don't know how many of these have, let's say they've got 30 units right now and you made 40 out of them, are those 10, would those count? Mm -hmm. Mr. Director Gardner, do you? Sure, I can answer if that's, uh, um, if, if that's the, uh, the comment. Uh, so yes, any net increase does count. So um, if units are subdivided and created more units or if additional units are added to a building and that was also something we discussed with the soft story group is that, you know, perhaps in conjunction with a seismic retrofit, there is an additional unit or two added that may also um, make the project pencil out better. Any net increase um, does count. And um, although it's a different topic, I also want to also mention ADUs also count um, in that those are also net increases. So um, pretty much any new unit that is um, taking the place of or, or in addition to anything existing gets to be counted. Yeah, that's an intriguing concept of uh, reconfiguring the, uh, the naturally uh, affordable unit buildings into more units. I think that's an interesting thought. Okay, uh, any other public comment? Yes, now we have Ms. Webster. Good evening, Ms. Webster. Uh, good evening, thank you. Uh, so my name is Kalisha Webster, and I'm the housing advocate for people with development and other disabilities at Housing Traces. As part of the housing element update process, Burlingham is required to assess and plan for the housing needs of certain special needs populations, including people with developmental disabilities. Developmental disabilities are a group of conditions which can affect cognitive and other functional areas, which severely impairs the ability to live in the community without coordinated supportive services. In addition to services, deeply affordable units are needed as most people with developmental disabilities depend on fixed incomes from disability benefits. Those that do work are typically only able to find employment in low wage part-time jobs, keeping them well below the income limit for extremely low income housing. However, according to the annual progress report, no extremely low income units were developed in Burlingame during the current RENA cycle, which began in 2015. While state affordable housing finance programs require the inclusion of units for people with mobility and hearing impairments, no such accessibility requirements exist for people with developmental disabilities who are also in need of affordable units to avoid displacement from Burlingame or worse, homelessness. Right now in Burlingame, approximately 86% of adults with developmental disabilities live at home with family or in segregated licensed care facilities, not by choice, but because of the lack of deeply affordable and accessible housing available to them. This is why it is critical that US city leaders develop programs and policies which respond to the specific housing needs of people with developmental disabilities in your housing element. Many other cities across San Mateo County are addressing this housing need by requesting that affordable housing developers include in their project plans a certain number of units for people with developmental and other disabilities who benefit from on-site supportive services. This strategy works as much needed in Burlingame. We ask that you implement policies and programs that make it more feasible for affordable housing developers to include people with developmental disabilities in their housing plans. Some of the general policies you can implement are awarding competitive advantage for city land and financing, the project proposals, which include people with developmental disabilities, reduce parking for transit oriented projects, which include people with developmental disabilities as they are often uh, transit dependent, 
and local concessions or incentives beyond what is allowed under the state density bonus law if they include extremely low income units. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webster, and uh, appreciate the comments. It's very timely. So, any other public comment? Um, I believe that is it. I don't have any emails. Very good. So I'm going to go back to uh, to my colleagues, but let's break this apart and let's start with number one, which is a, the motion we need pursuing a motion to adopt the housing element. So I will bring that back. Anybody have any comments on item number one? Or we could entertain a motion to accept the 2021 housing. Uh, Council member Colson. You're on mute. Just had one um, sort of comment. Um, you know, and I know that it deserves a, a response tonight, Kevin. It's just uh, to me a um, kind of one of the typical conundrums that goes on when we're trying to figure out housing. Under program, I think it's A H A four condo conversions. So you know, again, we discourage the conversion of, condom of of smaller 20, I think 20 or 21 units or fewer uh, projects into condominiums um, because we don't wanna lose rental housing. But at the same time, we have an enormous demand for entry level purchase of home ownership opportunities, which we will, I mean, we're so far away from home ownership opportunities right now. It's, it's not even funny. And so I just, I just point this out as one of these conundrums. I don't know that there's a solution. I personally would, would be, would welcome the opportunity when a building gets ready to be sold for it to be able to be sold to the tenants who might be able to purchase it. Um, if we could figure out a way to help them condominiumize the building and let them own it. I think it's a much larger, bigger, different conversation another day but it just shows me where sometimes policies that are well intended can, I think it, we could we could sort of twist them around or think about them in a different way. And then yes, we might be using some losing some affordable rental units, but we would be gaining potentially affordable ownership units and converting those people from renters into homeowners. So they can also get on to the um, you know, the cycle of wealth creation through housing. I just, I just point that out as something that always frustrates me in these plans. Thank you, Council Member Coulson. Uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to endorse Councilman Coulson's commentary. I think there's a lot of really interesting work and models being tried around the country um, to promote uh, first-time ownership. Frankly, I, I'd like to see heart become more of a regional leader in this regard too. But I, I completely endorse um, the notion that we have, there are really two ways to create wealth in our country to, you know, to start with, and that is to own a business or own a home. And we've made it incredibly difficult for people to own homes. Uh, so I, I endorse that. My comment about this section of the um, agenda, Mr. Mayor, is a, a hope. So I read the staff report carefully. I looked at the numbers as best I could on it's like microscopic font on no. a computer. <laughs> but I don't remember reading the actual report. And so my question, my favor that I ask you, Director Gardner, is to try to get a line in there, if you can, about how the city of Burlingame really does believe preservation of existing naturally affordable housing is an important public policy goal that is not captured in the RENA reporting requirements. And I just think we have to keep hammering the state on this point. Um, I think ultimately they need to reward cities for preserving uh, such housing and, and so forth. So if you could just try to get a line or two in there like that, I'd appreciate it. Certainly, we can add that to the transmittal. Okay, uh, Council Member Colson. I'll make a motion to accept the housing element as presented by the staff as and just a side comment, how well it was presented and how I, much I appreciate the really hard work that the staff does to go into this. I sometimes 
look at who's sitting in our attendees list and for all the meetings we have where people come and com comment about housing and want to talk about housing, this is probably the most important meeting of all. And, and I really appreciate Ms. Webster showing up because she's the one housing advocate person here who showed up today to speak. And I, and I want to thank her and I want to acknowledge her and um, say that, you know, in the meetings that really matter, I wish people would show, but they don't. So here we are. So as it is, I would um, make a motion that we accept it. And does your motion include the suggestion by Vice Mayor Brownrigg um, to add that sentence? That's fine. Yes. So we have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? I'd like to second also with a comment. I, I endorse what Councilman Colson said. I'd also like to say that we, we're obliged to write this report and it's a great report, but I really, um, I salute Director Gardner's comment earlier that that, um, and I'll put words in his mouth, either just mine, which is that, you know, this is a number checking exercise and it has been for years and years and years by the state. And what I'm proud about the council, not that, not a, that everyone always recognizes it, is, is that what we've done to promote housing in our city wasn't because Rena told us to, or Sacramento told us to, we did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. And that has always been our attitude. What is the right way to do housing? How much housing can we get? We know there's a crisis. What can we do to do our part? And we really never worried about Rena. It's nice that we're checking the box and that we're, over, we're ahead of schedule, but really we did it because we all thought it was the right thing to do. And I just wanted to add that to my, my second of the uh, motion. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. And before we vote, I'm going to open it to Council Member Beach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a process question. We're just talking about accepting the housing element, but we're going to continue the conversation on the policy, uh, the housing yes. policy in the next. Okay, thank you. My, my uh, limited mind can only handle one at a time. So, uh, so um, with that, I have a motion on the floor by Council Member Colson, a second by Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Uh, could we have roll call, please? Councilmember O'Brien? Yes. Councilmember Beach? Yes. Councilmember Colson? Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg? Yes. Mayor Ortiz? Yes. And with that, then we will move to uh, item number two on this uh, uh, staff report, which is provide preliminary direction on potential housing policies and programs to be considered in the upcoming housing element update. So, uh, Colleagues, any uh, comments on this one? And I believe, uh, Director Gardner, you're looking for a little direction from us as to how to handle this process. Um, I think it's, you know, I, we want to check in with the council first as we start the community engagement to see if there are ideas that are top of mind. Uh, we did hear one earlier, which is to maybe relook at the condo conversion policy and see if maybe that needs to be re-looked. So it's that kind of feedback that's helpful. Um, are there things that are in the current element that we want to revisit? Are there things that are not there at all um, that, that really should be? Um, and, and this is really a chance for the council to give initial direction. Um, and then this kind of direction, we can then filter through our community outreach and, and um, kind of introduce uh, ideas to the community that way as well. Very good. So I will open it to Council Member Colson. I see your hand raised. Thank you. Um, so just elaborating on that condo conversion conversation, um, I think one of the things that I hear mostly is that, um, and if we're worried about, again, income equity gap that's occurring, um, you know, when we all bought into Burlingame, and I know all of us have lived here for a long time, you could still buy a house in Burlingame, a home for $350,000. Um, that was not that long ago. And that same home is now, you know, 2.3 million, if not more. So figuring out a way through either condominiums or, um, you know, I know we, you know, we have SB9 that we haven't even talked about tonight. What does that look like with regard to arena numbers and how, how, you know, is that actually going to going to happen? Um, I, I think we just have to sort of start to think about how we might help those people get a rung. And it doesn't, it, it might be a first time home buyer through a condominium. Um, and maybe another option is when people are building, I know that they like to build 
sometimes they'll build condominiums, but then rent them for 10 years because of the indemnification issues that go along. But how do we get those then that are plot mapped, converted and sold? And maybe I think, as I recall, our feasibility, our numbers, our um, fees that we pay, I recall, I thought it was like higher on condominiums, actually, like somehow there might have been a, or there's some, le there's some incentive to produce rental housing and less owner housing for ownership. And I just feel like we need to think about how we're going to provide housing for ownership in this town. And maybe it's not first time home buyers, but boy, wouldn't it be nice if people with little kids could afford to come to our schools. Thank you, council member. Um, uh, so, so I'm trying to think of the way to put that in uh, is that w one of our, priorities uh, is to find creative ways to to find uh, owner for affordable homes for ownership versus rental. So um, uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. I, I was just gonna say on this point, I think this does merit a conversation and, and maybe this policy dialogue over the next couple of months is the right way to do it. I mean, the reason I think could because the, and the, the uh, restrictions on condo conversion, which are quite old in our city, stemmed from a view that we were going to lose apartments that were affordable and they were all going to get turned into expensive, you know, million dollar condos. So I don't, I'm not, I don't know what the right answer is. I'm just saying that this is, there is some probably public policy trade off. I'm enthusiastic about finding a way for people to get on an ownership ladder and off the rent hamster wheel. I completely agree, but we also have to be careful that we don't undercut another po public policy goal, which is to have affordable rental. Um, so, it, you know, and so since I have the mic, I'll just, I'll just um, segue. I, I think it's an interesting dialogue that you're setting up. And I realize we have to do this for the housing policy I, I do think it's, to me anyway, it feels sort of important. You know, I think the city has bit off a lot and, and we're all processing it. We have a lot to do. I guess I don't, I'm not sure I want to encourage people to think there's vast new ways to change the rules or certainly not to walk back these commitments. Um, so I think it's an interesting, it's why I asked the question earlier, it's sort of a challenging public outreach because We've done so much, we have so much to do. It's all pretty well outlined. And so the number of changes we need to make at this point, I, feels to me like relatively few. And so you kind of winding up the public and saying, pay attention, pay attention, oh, but wait, we've got it under control. There's not a lot that we really need your opinion on. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit torn. Um, I do think how we spend the money, which is the next chapter of this, is super interesting and, and I look forward to that. But I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I see housing policies like a sea of new housing policies that we really need. It feels like we have a lot going on. Thank you. Council Member Colson, were you gonna tag along something you said before or you want? I'll, I'll defer to uh, Council Member O'Brien and Sounds then good. I can come back I'll, on one. I'll come back to you. Council Member O'Brien. Uh, yeah, so I would actually agree with Council Member Brownrick. I think, you know, change in policy should be minimal. Uh, we've just made, we've come up with so much policy um, that, you know, I think we should just kind of follow that and see how it goes over, you know, the next five, 10 years. And then we may want to tweak it once we kind of see, you know, once people are, more people are, are moving in and what potential issues um, may be coming up that we maybe didn't have the foresight um, in regard to the condo conversions, that does concern me a little bit um, because I think with older buildings, that might be difficult um, in regards to one, the, the um, I think you have to have more open space uh, for condominiums and a lot of those apartments aren't going to have it. The other thing is converting those apartments to condos. Once you start um, doing major remodels, then you have to get the whole building um, up to code. And so that is an extremely expensive uh, process and probably wouldn't be worth it. So you probably wouldn't see too many of those conversions. Um, I agree with the fact it'd be nice to have entry level 
you know, condos for people to be able to afford to buy. I just think trying to turn um, apartments into condos is going to be very expensive and very difficult. And I think also I want to piggyback with this, um, something uh, Ms. Foth said was, you know, well, if um, these older units uh, might be able to um, split the units and, and have more units in an existing building, but you hit that problem again, where once you start the, the remodeling, it kicks that whole building uh, into um, meeting the most updated codes and then also means a lot of relocation fees, which um, you know many people won't be able to afford. So I just kind of wanted to bring those up, but I think our policies in general are pretty good uh, and I prefer not to touch them. Not at this time anyway. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go to Council Member Beach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great conversation tonight. I'm wondering if it might be helpful. There's so many great ideas that came up here for us to set some, I guess we started a couple of years ago. I don't think we ever completed it, whether or not we want to send some, set some goals as far as how, what the percentages are of these um, affordable housing funds that we want to invest, you know, targets for preservation, targets for subsidizing affordability, targets for if we do want to pursue the rental assistance program, emergency rental assistance program, um, or safety upgrades, like set those big picture things, and then we can figure out how to implement them with all these ideas. That might be a future conversation worth having. Um, big picture, some of the things I heard tonight that are really, that resonate with me are figuring out ways to subsidize the very low income units, which seems so hard for us to get. I feel like that needs to be a priority and certainly that can help folks with developmental disabilities, um, or, or just other folks that are in our service economy that, that need that subsidy that we can't, that, that are so hard to get unless we do something like um, our 100% affordable units that are coming online, hopefully next year. I also hope we could get this money to work by partnering maybe with a nonprofit organization or if the school district has a project or some other organization that might be having a project that maybe we could help use some of these funds to subsidize additional units. I think that would be a great use of funds. Um, the home ownership idea for tenants, I think that's a really intriguing idea. I recall being at Housing Leadership Council annual conference once and they had a presentation on different kind of, um, not necessarily converting to condos, but finding a way for the tenants to actually own the whole building as a group yeah. rather than individual units. And, you know, maybe that's something that could be explored too. The other reason I like that idea that Councilmember Coulson brought up is it helps displacement. Not only does it help build wealth, but it helps um, keep folks where they're living. Um, I know hip housing is doing a lot of really creative stuff with housing preservation and building and purchasing buildings in partnership with cities and other organizations. I love the idea of safety upgrades and retrofix with, um, with uh, seismic upgrades to keep things affordable, even though it might not get a big bonus on our arena numbers, I still think that would be a worthy use of these, fu of these funds to keep um, things safer. Definitely what we talked about years ago, if we needed some set aside for emergency rental assistance, I would like to see if the community still wants that when we do this housing element outreach. And I do think the unhoused population, the trends are showing it's going to keep growing. So if we need to somehow address that in a way, um, which is sort of a different different type of um, housing, but um, how, how we might be able to help deal with uh, unhoused folks might be worth exploring during this next parts of the conversation. So thanks for the, thanks for the great ideas tonight. Thank you. And back to council member Colson. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think what you're talking about is tenant in common. It's tenant in common, which is a way for um, so so. What's going on in Burlingame? I think is when the rents get high enough, the rent can sustain a very high level of mortgage, especially when interest rates are low as they have been. So tenant in common also has some problems, but um, I think all I'm saying about the condo conversions is. You would actually probably have to re look at that and say, look, if people are living here as apartment building owners, they, they're, you know, 
yes, this wouldn't meet the standards for a condo because it would not have enough parking. It wouldn't have this, but we already have people living in them and they're sort of grandfathered in. So could you, whether in some way, if the bill, and I would actually only do it for buildings that came for sale, where the people were looking at getting displaced, if there was a way to try to figure out how to help the tenants purchase the building at market from the owner and collaborate to come together to purchase that building and then either own it, like you say, as tenant in common or whatever. Again, it's another discussion. It's just trying to think outside the box for when we have a disposition of a building, how we might preserve that housing for people who are already living in it. Um, and then I think back to Michael's question or Councilman or Vice Mayor Brownrigg's question around the, um, what are we gonna talk about at these community convenings? I think one of the most important things to talk about is why we're building so much housing in Burlingame. Because that's, if you read next door, Facebook, you look at anything, all you're gonna see is people going, wow, they're building a lot of housing and building. I can't believe they're going to approve another project in Burlingame. Wow. Did they approve another project in Burlingame? I hear there's 400 units going over here, 300 going there. So, you know, I think there's still not a complete understanding in our community about, you know, how the whole process works and how the state tells us, and then we have to implement. There's still not an understanding about SB9 and how that works and who can use it. So I think I would use this as an opportunity to, you know, really kind of chat more about um, and, and educate edification of the community as to why we do what we do and how we're doing it yeah. from the skeptic side. That's a good point. I think the, the director Gardner had mentioned there's some education and it is a very com complex uh, topic. And I think it, it, I think that's a really good idea. Council member O'Brien. Well, I would like to piggyback uh, what council member Coulson said is you know, we have to educate even the people outside of our community um, that have many have a tendency to say Burlingame isn't doing anything. And um, I'm really tired of hearing that. And so I think we really need to use this opportunity for all the work we have done and, and how forward we have been in really getting ahead of, of the curve uh, in comparison to, you know, many cities. And so this to me is in some ways celebrating our accomplishments. And uh, in addition, what we're going to work on, you know, over the next eight years in this next cycle. So to me, it's just a, a complete education on what we are actually doing um, in Burlingame. Thank you. It's funny how we're accused of nimbyism and overbuilding at the same time. So that's interesting. Uh, Council Member uh, Brown or Vice Member Brown, right? I, I like the the uh, direction this is taking. And I, I think that's smart. Um, you know, in a way, the housing, even though we're supposed to be talking about the housing policies of the next decade or whatever, um, you know, having material on the Rollins Road neighborhood and what we're doing and what, you know, renderings and stuff. In that respect, I think those community sessions could be really both interesting and helpful to, um, and so now I understand that better. I think that's a great way to use that, those sessions. I think that's a great point. I think a picture is worth a million words. So uh, council member O'Brien. Uh, yes, and I, and I do wanna add, you know, when the time comes and we're having these community meetings, I think it would be very helpful um, to invite um, our legislators who are making these mm -hmm. policies and don't realize actually what many of these cities are, are doing. And so I think it's a good education for them also. Great idea. Okay, colleagues, uh, this is item number two. So do you have any last comments on this? Oh, do, I guess we already did public comments. So um, any final comments on this before we move on to item number three? You, you don't need a motion for this, Mr. Mayor, is that no, right? No, I think it was just direction for uh, Director Gardner so on how to move forward. And I hope, Director, that you received enough direction. Okay. Yes, and I think this was particularly helpful in, um, Framing the outreach, and you know, I think if we think back to our um, home for all meetings a few years ago, and and really, it's it's telling the story as much as getting the input, and uh, so I think we can uh, really emphasize that with our our outreach. Thank and, you. And and do let us know, uh, Director Gardner, when you're hosting these things, and if there are tables at mar um, farmers markets and whatnot, maybe one or 
two of us, you know, would show up for an hour. I mean, I, you know, I think sometimes that's kind of helpful too. So I'm sure we'd all be willing to try if we have the time. We did it for Megan. We'll do it for you. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, then we will move on to item number three. And we're going to provide preliminary direction on potential uses of housing funds collected from commercial linkage fees. So I, I think um, in the last item, we already discussed a lot of uh, different ideas, uh, but I'm wonder if uh, council member Beach had, well, okay, now I see two hands. Let's start with council member Colson. So again, one of the things I think is really important and I appreciate Ms. Webster coming and um, got to have a meeting with GatePath recently. Um, I do think it is really important to figure out ways that we can um, be as inclusive as possible with our um, people with special needs. And so I'll kind of leave it at that. But I will also say that, um, you know, I sit on these NOFA allocations, 30, 40, 50 million dollars every cycle and watch them go out. And the hardest part about it is they're really targeting a lot of this funding toward DACs. And somehow Burlingame, even though we're 54% renters, and even though we have a couple Title I schools and we do clearly have low income areas, we always get um, you know, passed over. So uh, be, because you know, of the on the balance and how it all how you calculate all those. So um, a lot of this funding tends to sit in certain areas of our county and just isn't even really available for, for us. So to me, these funds are going to be really important to um, where I see the biggest need in these projects is the original like $500,000 to $750,000 that often the developers need to kind of pull all the plants together and kind of kick the whole project off. And then once they get to that stage, they can get the 4% or the 9%, um, you know, uh, funds. So um, I suppose it's, um, you know, the hospital, Peninsula Hospital, um, I'm supposing they're maybe asking, I don't know if they're doing that all on their own or not. And uh, GatePath is doing some, they seem to be having a good job doing all theirs, but um, that initial $500,000, you know, whether it's through the heart rotation fund or whatever, might be a really important way to kick off some more of these projects. And then again, just focusing on the very low income and how we can maximize our dollars to help the most people. Might be through rental support as well, through working with, continuing to work with Samaritan House, um, you know, I'm open to all of those ideas. So I, I'm intrigued with what you were saying about people with disabilities, because I think th th there we could get um, both trying to get the category of the low, low uh, and help people with disabilities who have special needs and special uh, allocations. So I don't know, what, did you have something in mind of how that could be addressed? Well, I think it's working with partners like GatePath, who is building, I think, 40 or so units right over here and helping to find out if they need any, you know, if they have any spots they need. Because, yeah, financing. Yeah, and I, because I really think the critical thing here is that the, and I think uh, Councilwoman O'Brien has really kind of helped me understand this with her work in the mental health side of the business is that a lot of these people, there's, it's not just the housing, but it's the support services that go with them. And so um, like a one-off here and a one-off there, like it might be hard. And I see Miss uh, Webster still on the call. So, you know, maybe there's, you know, we need to do some research specifically on that or have like a little, you know, have our staff work on this to figure out the best options for that so that we could include the wraparound services you know, the other one we have, we do have one here. Um, I know that Rob Weimeyer and Kendra Weimeyer worked on it. Um, and it's through the event that I'm going to go to this weekend that I think uh, Council Member O'Brien's going, which is, um, oh no, this is Parka. So Parka, I think, actually owns a house in Burlingame and it, it houses three or four, five people. Um, and we've helped them you know, they got money through the NOFA to renovate that house to deal with the ADA issues and a bunch of other things that needed to get done. So 
I don't know, maybe it's even just helping our families that have a, a child who can't quite live independently, but maybe to build an ADU in the backyard for that person to live independently still with their family, but having an opportunity to live independently, maybe we could help fund, you know, the permits for that, or we could do something that would allow that to count as a new unit, very low income, and it would help a family be able to stay together, but live independently. So those are maybe some ideas. Yeah, I think that's great. I, I like the idea about the house, but unfortunately, I think for as far as arena numbers, that would count as one unit, even though you have six residents, right? Well, at the, sure. at the end of the day, it's about serving people yeah. and not serving Rena, right? I mean, so. no, no, I, I absolutely get it. But I, I think that we can look at programs that address both of them. But I, yeah, I think if we're doing the right thing, I'm, I'm 100% with you. But it's such a challenge for us to find the low, low that when we have an opportunity like this, we need to explore it. But yeah, anyway, you, you had your hand raised, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, First of all, I endorse what Councilman Colson and, and would love to see us be more creative, but I won't repeat that. Um, when it comes to, so this question on the table is the use of funds and, and Councilwoman Beach threw out a lot of different ideas. The one that I'm most interested in understanding better, and I think we may have to actually, I'm not usually the one who wants to hire outside experts, but here I think we might have to. And that is how much does it cost to buy down a unit from market rate to, you know, fill in the blank, 80% of AMI, 60% of AMI, 30% of AMI, because I don't know. And, and I, but I do know this, that the fastest way to get an actual affordable unit into the market will be to tag along with somebody who's already building something. By the time we wait to generate enough money in our funds to build something on a piece of land, we've all watched how slow the, village has been and that's a that's a private sector developer you know i mean we're going to be a decade before we build anything of, on our own just being government so i i want to put the money to work but i want to be smart about it and i don't know how much we should offer a developer to oh. take, take the unit at the bottom of Truesdale, you know, the 300 plus units. And I forget what the percentage that's affordable is it 10% maybe, you know, what does it cost to bring another 10% of those units down affordable? I don't know. And I think we should know before we spend much more time deciding what buckets to put money in, you know, it's a, it's all about what's the best social return on this investment, I think. So oh. I, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. So let me just make sure I'm understanding you correctly. So what you're, what you're suggesting is that we use some of the funds and, and I'm, again, we have to investigate it, but the su suggestion is we use some of the funds uh, in the fund that we collected to pay a developer to commit to having that more units at the low or at affordable levels. And we can discuss what affordability, but right. certainly getting to low, low, taking one of the the moderate and making it low, low with an infusion of, of well, or cash. taking a or taking a market rate and bringing it to eighty percent. I mean, there's, you know, it, it's you can do that. You just have to pay the developer whatever his his loss is. And the problem is, you know, we need to be smart negotiators in knowing what that price is, right? We can't just stumble in and. With our oh, I, I, I really like that idea. I, I want to really endorse that. I think that's great because then you have people who know what they're doing, building it, and we're just piggybacking on them, putting our money to work. So I, I love that idea. I think that's something we should really pursue. So are you done, Mr. Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor? Yes. I will move on to, I didn't notice who's went up first. I'm going to go with Council Member O'Brien. Um, so I would agree probably with most of the suggestions um, from my colleagues. Um, as I have mentioned before, I, I am interested in looking at putting some of the money toward preservation of um, existing units. But, you know, we have to do investigation and see, you know, how can we, what types of things need to be preserved and how do we preserve it and what is the cost range um, of that. Um, and then, you know, it, I, I'd like to see part of the money going toward emergency funding. Um, things happen. Uh, you could have someone that has been paying the rent continually, 
um, but then it just takes maybe one emergency uh, in the family, whether it's, you know, health issue or maybe a divorce and you have a single mom with, you know, two kids. Um, those types of emergencies come up and, you know, they may need some assistance for a month or two. Uh, and so having a, a fund available to distribute for something like that um, may be preventing someone from becoming homeless. And so I think that's something that uh, we should look into. And emergency funding, are you picturing it of like partnering with nonprofits who already do that so we could just supplement what they do? We could do it that way or, or we may want to put a program together ourselves. Um, so... I mean, we can be very, you know, flexible with that. And I'd like to actually know what, maybe if there are other cities that are doing it that have been successful and what the criteria, what type of criteria they've developed. Yeah, I like that idea. Okay, great. Did you have anything else? You're done? Okay. Um, no, I, 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 I'm done. And, and actually it would have been something handy to have with COVID kicking yeah, no in, kidding. you know, so you just never know what's around the corner, so. Yeah, and I think yeah, for some people with medical issues that can really cause some havoc, and it'd be great to be able there to support them. So, uh, Council Member Colson. Um, thanks. So, I I I think, and maybe Kevin remembers this, but didn't we ask Summerhill um, about a buy down on one of their new projects? And I think to buy the existing. It down like it, I mean it was millions and millions of dollars as I recall that's right um it was it was one of the projects and and I can't remember the question exactly whether it was to provide more affordable units or units at a deeper affordability uh, but they did have a number so um and it was in the millions but um we're also now talking about fees in the millions so um, I think that is something we could look at um, as, as an option. And um, it, I, I as, guess as, the, the issue I have is I, I don't want to take $5 million worth of fees and help five, five people or 10 people. I, I just don't. I don't want to take $10 million, $5 million of the fees and only help five. I want to try to help 100 or 200 people. So to me, um, you know, we are, you know, we got to figure out the number is 138. We're not even going to remotely close to get there. You know, at, I mean, it would take, if it's if it, depending on what it is per unit, it would take forever. But so I guess um, I do like the idea of piggybacking on it. <coughs> it's going to be much higher than you think to do a buy down or to buy units down um, because you just look at the Delta on the rent, the market rent versus 30% AMI, 30% AMI is um, for a single person is, Thirty thousand dollars, roughly. So to call it thirty, that's a thousand a month. If they can rent an apartment, a building, a unit for five thousand, and you're asking them to take an eighty percent haircut on the rent, when you factor that into the value, they're going to require a very big number to make up. You're going to be making up basically four thousand dollars of rent every month on that apartment in order to, for the developer to to go along with that, unless you force them into it which is another option, you know, through your housing linkage fee work. But I just, um, I think those numbers are huge and you might be better off focusing on the existing stock of housing and that's already naturally affordable and working with Samaritan House and making sure that people don't get evicted from their homes that, and, that, and, that, and we do the buy downs there as opposed to the new units because the pricing isn't going to be as much. I mean, you could go to, you know, and again, it's not going to get us a new number on the arena chart, but if that's not the main concern and the main concern is keeping people housed, then focusing on that already affordable and making sure that those people can stay and don't get eked out is better, I think. But if you want to for, focus on units, it might be cheaper to say, again, go back to like either the ADU um, conversation and try to help people who need to buy or want to build a unit for low-income grandparents, a child with special needs, a parent with special needs, a parent who has Alzheimer's, you know, something like that. And focusing on helping those people get that second unit going or built, you know, that might actually get you more production than the other way around. 
Thank you. Council Member Beach. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll be quick because I guess I listed off the things that uh, resonated in the in the prior section a little bit early, but just um, two other brief comments. I do think if we explore um, subsidizing very low income, it, it would be great if we could partner with a non uh, nonprofit developer who's maybe got a project sort of in the works um, and help subsidize. I just think that the motivations in the nonprofit sector can be easier to, to manage rather than buying down in the private in the private sector. Um, I do I do recall talking to some um, nonprofit housing developers that that said at least a couple of years ago, you know, even th three or million dollars or so of working capital from a city can really help them cobble together projects where we wouldn't necessarily have to take the lead like we did with the village at Burlingame, but could really help um, provide the capital that can help them do what they do best. So that might be worth exploring too. And then finally, I'm glad that colleagues see and are considering um, possibly allocating some of these funds for emergency rental assistance. It seems like the program that we established during COVID with Samaritan House for Burlingame folks uh, that needed emergency uh, economic assistance might be might be a great model and uh, kind of turnkey from since we've already done it recently. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. I think what this shows is is how because um, all of these are good points and and they're all going to be good ideas and we're just not going to have enough money. So I think to me what this speaks to is trying to set up a a time where we can be a little more expansive, not nine o'clock at night and, and have different options where you can sort of see the, the trade-offs um, and really talk it through. And I don't think this is, you know, right and wrong. I think, you know, these are gonna be hard decisions to decide where best to put the money. I mean, I will share that for me, thinking about housing policy, and I'm a huge fan of, of course, of the Burlingame Village, but as a general matter, when we can have mixed incomes in a building, um, I think that's a good thing socially. I think that um, we, so that's, that's the flip side to why buying down units in an existing building or either whether it's an older building or a new building going up creates, I think, some other social outcomes that are useful. Um, but, but mostly I appreciate this conversation and what it feels to me like is one where you need to have a little more data and maybe a glass of wine really <laughs> try to figure Shot out of something there's a lot of there's a lot of trade-offs here you know and and we're all trying to do the right thing well let, let me let me see if i can kind of summarize what we've all said uh, and let me start by saying but i think that we all agree that we need to find whatever gives us more bang for our buck and when i say that is when we need to help the most families for the least investment that we make. And to council member Colson's point, uh, maybe the buying down may not work, but I think it's worth investigating. Um, also, uh, as far as uh, looking for our arena numbers, we're looking for the low low. So when we have programs that can help increase low, low units, uh, I think that's another thing that we need to pay special attention to. I think the, um, the conversation about people with disabilities, I think, is very important uh, because it does help a very special need, and it might also help us with arena numbers. Uh, the buying down, I, I'm very intrigued, and it might be that it's just it doesn't pencil out and it doesn't make any sense, but I think it's worth looking into. Um, the preservation, I think I hear from everybody. I think that's the preservation is one that I think we all agree on. I think we uh, uh, very strongly, and you can do the combination of the buy down and the preservation all in one program. I think the council member O'Brien was the one who su suggested that one. Uh, I, emergency funding, I think that's kind of a no brainer. I think everybody's good with that one uh, allocating. We're going to get to the point where we have to figure out what the amounts are for each one of them, and that's where the discussion will get a little trickier. But we all agree that that that's a good uh, use and. Uh, the question that I have on that one is, do we, you, do we do our own program or do we work with the nonprofits? And I lean more towards the nonprofit uh, um, for that because they know what they're doing. We don't need to reinvent the wheel and that staff. Uh, and then uh, the other idea that's uh, 
a nonprofit project uh, where we can add uh, financing to make something possible that otherwise wouldn't be. And I think that's a very good one. And I think that's where we could get a lot of bang from our buck and help a lot of uh, families all at once. Uh, so colleagues, uh, I'm sorry, Don, uh, Council Member Colson, I see your hand is raised. Thank you. Um, I just, through the mayor, and I, and I just want to sort of check this out. You know, we used to, pre-COVID, we were doing a lot of work in little subcommittees and stuff. And I just don't know, uh, Director Gardner or Mayor Ortiz, if this is the type of thing where maybe we should, you know, like, I think, I think of two things right off the bat. I think of City Hall, which I think is Council uh, Member Councilwoman O'Brien and Mayor Ortiz who are working on that together, and like maybe biting off a little bit on that. Like, should we renovate City Hall or redo City Hall somehow? We have that on our big list of infrastructure projects, and look at um, housing in that. You know, in if if we do it, and maybe we need to just at least visit it and you know throw it out or keep it in or whatever you don't want to give all your fees away and then find it find out that you need them for your own project that you want to try to do um you know there's that, there's that five-year horizon we can we work fast we work fast. <laughs> but we have a lot more fees coming in and i see city manager goldman and the other is just that you know we're working on like through um through uh home for all san mateo home for all and i'm on the steering committee we're still doing a lot of work there around teacher housing, feasibility, and other things. So I don't know, maybe it, would it be helpful to have a smaller working group that could just sort of hash this out a little more, kind of like we did with North Rollins Road or something, and maybe come back and present, you know, more topics to to the bigger group or, or should we just let staff hash it out? I'm, and I'm okay either way, just kind of. Let's, uh, I'm going to let uh, our city manager speak and then we can bring it back to the group to see what the consensus is. Thank you. So um, two points. One is that staff is actually um, talking about uh, public private partnership opportunities for city hall. So we'll have more for you at some point on that, but it's not agendized. So I don't want to give more than that. Um, number two, as uh, Kevin and I were talking about this item and also with mayor Ortiz, we did say that at some point we want to go into subcommittee to flesh out these options and then come back in a study session format. Our, our choice was to do a study session first and then go to a subcommittee or do subcommittee first and then study session. And I think subcommittee first and then do a study session um, based on how this conversation has gone would be most efficient. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Colleagues, any comments on that uh, format? Okay, don't all talk at once. Um, okay, so with that, uh, if uh, Director, I hope you had enough uh, um, direction there. I think we had some good discussion and uh, I think we have a lot of homework to do. So um, are we good to move on? So uh, the only question is whether Mayor Ortiz, you wanna appoint the subcommittee now or we can chat about it offline. Um, you have the ability to appoint subcommittees. Let's, uh, let's take it offline. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. My only favor is that um, when it comes time to have the study session to review a subcommittee or, or whether it's staff or subcommittee, whoever, can we make sure that there's enough time for that study session? Um, I'm not sure how to do that, whether it's to put it as part of the official agenda or it's just to have two hours, but I... I think an hour would constrain us and I would worry about that. I'm just, that's just. For yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly been really nice tonight just talking through this without having to rush. So I, I do appreciate your comments. So uh, we will take that into consideration when moving forward. Um, Council member Colson. Thanks. Um, I mean, per personally, because there's so many things, including, um, you know, the work we were doing around catalyst housing, that was also, remember Michael, we had that meeting in 2019 to talk about that. So there's so many things out here that it seems to me um, that you might almost want to have like its own separate night, kind of like we do the budgets or something. It, it, it might merit, it, it's big enough and hunky enough and 
and that, that, and you need to focus enough and really think about it, that it might just merit a special meeting on a Wednesday night or Saturday morning or something. If I know it's asking a lot of people that. No, and it's hopefully what it, by doing it that way, we can get more interested parties to show up and give us some more comment. Cause I frankly yeah. kind of disappointed that we had as little as we did tonight. Yeah, I would agree. And, and then, um, and I don't know if on the subcommittee you want to put anyone with housing expertise from, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you could, if you want to mix something in like that, but <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I think, I think it's the best way to work. Um, and I just appreciate, um, I appreciate that. That will be the process. Perfect. Thank you for your input. And I, I will, I will consult with staff and then we'll put something together, but I think that is the best way to move forward. And, uh, but that was really a good conversation guys. And, uh, I, think that uh, hopefully we gave staff enough direction and I think we've narrowed it down to a few things to pursue. So with that, are we done here? Yes, very good. So then we will move on to item number 11, which is council committee and activities reports and announcements. So colleagues, do you guys have anything to report? Uh, council member or vice mayor Brownry? I just want to thank the mayor for his support and colleague support um, I was reappointed to the heart board for another three years, and that allows us to continue to work in the strategic committee to try to significantly improve heart for all of us. And uh, I keep meaning to write that up and I will try to for the next meeting. But anyway, I just wanted to report that. Thank you. Very good. And I appreciate having a conversation about that part to the vote. So like, like you thought I was going to vote for anybody else, but whatever. <laughs> but no, I appreciate it and I'd like to hear about your vision. So colleagues, anybody else? And having none, then I will move on to item number 12, which is future agenda items. And I don't see anybody jumping through the screen. So with that, we'll move to acknowledgements. So just to let you know that there are agenda packets and meeting minutes for the Planning Commission, Traffic Safety Parking Commission, Beautification Commission, Parks and Rec Commission, and the Library Board of Trustees are available at www.berlingdame.org. And then for adjournment, uh, I think our um, our uh, Mayor Nagel um, had some very nice words about Suzanne Teddy Ocean. Um, she was a lovely person. I had, uh, I met her many, many years ago when I coached their daughter. Uh, and I think I can't say enough. I think, uh, the mayor, Mayor Nagel knows her much better than I do. And I appreciate her comments. And with that, if we could just have a moment of silence for Suzanne Teddy Ocean and, uh, just our best to Jeff and the children. So, And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all. That was a great conversation. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you.